evening on a very warm day. First piece of advice to you, particularly to the gentleman, is take your jackets off if you want. Don't feel you need to keep your jackets on. Andy's got his jacket in his bag, but he, he's already lobbied me and I said no, no jackets. Unless you're on the top table, of course, when you have to be there because you'll be in all the photos. And, and talking to the top table, thank you. We, we, have a, we have a very brainy panel for you to ask difficult questions. We've got a brainy audience as well. That's a problem for you. We've got a brainy audience and a brainy panel. So we should have a brainy conversation. And that's what we, we certainly hope. Because today's a very important day for us because a lot of people have been working very hard for two years to bring, br bring together, uh, make concrete or make steel or make alive some uh, concepts to demonstrate that it's not just possible to be more efficient, it is inevitable, it's the future, it's here now and the people in this room, all of us, are part of the changing the culture. We are looking forward to being joined by Trudy Harrison who's got a new set of responsibilities and a promotion so we're looking forward to uh, speaking with her and we're, we congratulate Andrew Stevenson who's been a good supporter all the way through to becoming promoted to Minister Without Portfolio which sounds quite good but I think it's you get all the horrible jobs to, to solve really so anyway he's, he'll do well at that because he's very calm. Uh, we're going to have some inputs throughout the day. We're going to have the round table. I'm going to say a few introductory words. The minister will speak and then the minister will, will sort of lead us round the, through the round table, but we will have a chance to ask questions as well. As, uh, as the chair of the, the delivery board and leading the PMO, uh, you know, you can be absolutely up to, you know, too close to this. And I was having a conversation yesterday with some colleagues who were in a room trying to uh, influence some, some people in the Treasury and convince some people in the Treasury that uh, it was possible in transport to be more productive. And uh, I, was, I was part of the conversation but not, not leading it. And as the conversation went through, it was, oh yeah, we've got that. Oh, we've got that. And it suddenly what, what looked, what could look from the outside like a big collection of things. When, when you broke down the challenge, well, if you wanted to, to improve productivity, you'd have to do X, Y, and Z. Oh yeah, we've got a demonstrator here that has shown that and shown the benefit of that and brought the, the time of that down, the carbon down, the cost down. And, and it really was a moment for me actually, because uh, it, it really showed that the that the, the problems that the ALBs brought to the table, the vision of those at the outset, DFT, the ties uh, task force, you know, th there, was, there was a lot of breadth to it. And I think I've had to explain more than once the, the, how it all fits together. Well, it, it came together in that conversation for me and I think for the other people in the room. So I hope it comes together for you today. I think it will. So first of all, there's lots involved mostly here today and uh, it's been quite a journey and of course we did have Covid which was always, it was in the risk log, <laughs> we did, I looked at the, we had, a, we had pandemic in the risk log, the mitigation was in fact, <laughs> the likelihood was low and the mitigation was home working. <laughs> so we did that and but first thank you to everybody for making that work. At times I thought we'll never make this work but everybody made it work and you know it, it it, it, it was, uh, I'm going to change the risk log now to next time to highly likely but low impact because we know how to do it now. So that was, that was incredible. And thank you to uh, IUK and DFT for giving us an extra three months. Bit miserable really. I'd have thought six months would have been more reasonable but you gave us three months and we were, we were grateful for that. So today is the day where we start to look forward. We, we, we do reflect on what we've got but it's really about the legacy and the culture change that we so badly need. And as we've gone through the last two years, if you think about where we started, we thought we needed this two years ago. Boy, do we need it now. And uh, it, it, it's fascinating to, to, to look at the current political process and think, yeah, where are you going to get the money from for all of that? Well, they'll come to us and we'll be ready now because we will be able to give a scientific evidence-based view on what efficiency and productivity could look like. So we wanted to understand 
these things up there, especially around uh, modernization. Whole life value is an obsession and not as well understood as it could be. And benchmarking is the way, and I'm sure I don't want to steal David's thunder, but I'm quoting him a lot just now. Benchmarking is something that gives us confidence in we don't need to test the market every two minutes in tiny dribs and drabs because the benchmarks allow us to do that. I'm sure you'll say more on that later, David. I certainly hope so. And one of the, the, the game changing things has been the dialogue between the arm's length bodies. And I include TFL as an arm's length body in that. I'm watching the arm's length bodies work ever more closely together to the point now where I think it's standard, it's normal, and it's comfortable for people. Sharing data, sharing problems. And we've had, we had a marketplace last, last week where, where the demonstrators were sharing their views. And it was really, it, it, it was a real team effort. So that's good. And thank you to, you know, DFT have been particularly strong on, on uh, encouraging that. So we, we, how do you measure the benefits? Normally, you would just be measuring money, wouldn't you, in these kinds of conversations. But of course, the, the social value agenda and the carbon agenda, we, we wrote parts of this four years ago. And think how the priorities have broadened. And, and well done to the partners for responding. And actually, th this wasn't what we set out to do, but the carbon benefits. I was a bit worried about carbon, actually. Not, I'm worried about carbon, as we all are. But I was a bit worried it might distract us a bit from our core task. And one of the findings that you will see is that actually the, the close association between cost reduction and carbon reduction, and my friend Dan James on the panel always says that, and I, I always thought he was just saying that because it sounded good. But actually, Dan, it was true. And, and our, our, we see that in a number of our, our demonstrators. But we also see safety improvements. People on the track or in a risky environment for a short amount of time is really important, and we've been able to show that. Uh, cooling panels, uh, we, we need them, and uh, we need them today, and we really need them next week. And it was, it's good that Paul, Paul James has organised the, uh, the, the meeting next week for the cooling panels on the hottest day of the year. So well done, Paul, for that. That's, that's good, good forward planning. And logistics, fuel, fuel costs. Fuel costs, who'd have thought we'd be paying two pound a gallon for, for diesel? Well, fuel costs have been one of the things that the advanced logistics tool have been looking at. So that's been uh, really topical. So I suppose what you could conclude from that is that the agenda got broader and more demanding and the partners responded. So well done for that and thank you. There's been a debate, a lively debate with government around how you measure some of this stuff. It's not all finished yet, but we've had Professor Malcolm Horners here. We've been having interesting debates around how you measure productivity, what the carbon measures are. So I like to think we've made an intellectual contribution to government thinking as well as, if you like, a more practical contribution. You might not see all of that, but it's there. And uh, the, the whole policy world has moved on. And of course, the TIP roadmap and the construction uh, playbook, these are, these are now a thing and they weren't a thing when we started. And happily, and it's not a coincidence, we are uh, in tune with those. And actually, that will be one of the ways that DFT takes these really important policies forward. Communities of practice. These are our way of mainstreaming and uh, getting longevity into the dialogue between the arm's length bodies. So they will take forward some of our thinking, sharing, whether it's harmonization of standards, that kind of thing. Real solid work done there, and we'll hear from uh, Andy later on, on on some of those things. But social value, how you measure social value, that's been a, that's been a debate and been a core and very impressive uh, feature of government, uh, government thinking. And we've, we've, we've developed a tool, we're working in partnership, Liz from Network Rail's here, who, who, who's been leading that within Network Rail, but we've got a tool that's broader transport wide and working together. So that's really showing the benefits because what we want to prove and we are proving is that it's a good bet. Transport infrastructure is a good bet for the government. We create good jobs, good social value 
and we'd rather have a new road or a new railway or a new bridge than a submarine. Thank you very much. Don't quote me on that, but that's but that's what we're that's the that's the world we're in. Just one level down now. It's 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 time to boast. I'm boasting on behalf of the excellent uh, demonstrator projects and partner partnership activities. But we're seeing some quite big numbers. So the and these are all being these are all being further tested. But there's been a, an element of scrutiny, and we have a, a panel of uh, extra brainy people who really ask the difficult questions about these. So we, you will have numbers in the final report that you can have absolutely full confidence in. But you know, we are pretty certain on, on these as of now. So there's some big numbers in there. Footbridges, for example, 100 million in whole life costs. Whole life costs are something everybody says and not many understand. I really think we're starting to help people to understand what the difference that is. And in our benchmarking study before TIES, which we did with DFT and IPA, every major productivity improvement in, in infrastructure had a whole life value dimension to it. And our colleagues in energy and water were particularly good at that. And we, we, we copied from them unashamedly because they, they got some, some things right. It's a shame what they did with the money they, they saved, but that's a different question. In terms of the signaling equipment rooms, flexible, modern, movable, reusable, absolutely uh, saving, will save money. And th these are all cautious numbers. Cable route management, uh, some of the, in this room uh, a couple of months ago, we spent quite a lot of time particularly looking at that one and the huge savings in time particularly time savings and time is money and we've been in a fascinating place to, with experts on measuring time well you measure time with a watch but how do you value it and there's a there's a there's a there's a kind of i wouldn't say it's a science i would say it's a it's a proto science in how you value time but we need to get better at valuing time and also valuing asset availability so and and i know these discussions are very much in the minds of uh, the, the, the money people at the top. So we're seeing that. And of course, then the, the advanced logistics tool, the savings just in fuel, just the cost and the carbon. That's an example of where cost and carbon. And the uh, costain led IICC, smoothing out data flow. I, 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 people who don't think that the government measuring uh, data in, in construction projects and infrastructure operations. Closer measurement of data is coming and uh, it's, it's, it's inevitable and uh, it could have been here even sooner than it is, but the tools like the IICC are really helping us see how to create these dashboards. Going on, I wanted to highlight just a few things here. The, the demonstrators are now up and running or, or nearly up and running and uh, will, will be finished in uh, this month or in the case of the footbridge by the end of September. So we will, they'll be there, you can touch them. And I remember in our early conversations with IUK and uh, who, who are our funders and thank you again to them, that, that they really wanted to, they really wanted, to, they emphasised the importance of having something they could touch and these are all touchable and uh, I think that will help make it make it real for people. <clears throat> the use of artificial intelligence is something that we, we know is coming, we hear about it every day, we're exhorted to, to do it, but what does that mean for us on Monday morning? Well, we've got an idea, having been using it for some of our, uh, some of our activities and you'll hear a bit more about that later as well. Further level down, the analytical consortium. The, there, are, there are those, and I've met them, who will scrutinise to death any of the claims, the business plans that the ALBs put together, the bids that are put together by the supply chain. We need to have a proper language that measures this and understands it and some confidence. And for David's point about uh, benchmarking is a way of uh, testing the market only if you've got confidence in it and I thank Malcolm Horner for uh, leading that consortium and for the good work they've done. 
<clears throat> I've mentioned the cooling panels. So social profit calculator is, is a way of making it easy for people to understand and measure social value. Because social value could, can be many things. It is many things. And we really need to have, that's part of our responsibility. And it's, it, we're, we're bringing a real practical, tangible, this is what it means on Monday morning to that activity of measuring. And as a result, more people will measure it, more people will understand it, and it will become part of our core language. Not in terms of, no one here thinks we're not delivering social value with transport infrastructure, but how much? And how, is it more than a submarine? For my flippant, but perhaps real example. But you know, really, if you're making a, a judgment on two different uh, investments, the government will want to understand what's the social value dimension. And we've, the, the, again, the strides there have been very good. In terms of the policy world, the people who write, write the brainy policies I mentioned earlier, many of them are in the room. And these are now standard government policy that we expect the, uh, the whole of government to implement. Uh, and ministers will come and go. And I can say that because I don't think Trudy's in the room yet. But the, the, these policies, I'm sure, will remain. And I'm confident they'll remain because they're good, they're right, and they capture some of the things that we would all have said is, is the kind of things that's important. One of the areas we haven't touched on, and I think is for, is for so it's not part of the legacy of, of Ty's Living Lab, but it will be part of the next conversation, is capability. Because the people in this room and our friends who aren't here and some online uh, have shown that they can deliver things, but it's not been easy. And there's a capability in managers, a commercial understanding, a digital understanding, a technical understanding that is asking new questions of managers. And uh, we've shown it can be done, but equally, I think we can all see that this is, this is an activity that when it becomes normal, we will need to pre prepare our managers for. And uh, my colleague Guy Wilmser smith who's a big advocate of, of this from, uh, from Network Rail Training is here, and he'll be somebody who will be very much helping us understand the new, the new requirements for that in, in, in his business, and I hope the other businesses as well. And the supply chain will tell us that they're really, really good at this and I've, I've just been waiting for the opportunity to, to do it. And that's probably even partly true. But I think there'll be, uh, I think there's an opportunity for all the senior managers to learn. I think one of the last things I want to say at this stage is it's been, <coughs> we've been audited by the, the government audit people. That wasn't fun. <laughs> Uh, they're thorough and we survived that. We've had huge scrutiny from, uh, very professional scrutiny, overly thorough in my view, but anyway, it's been good from both IUK and DFT. So we've had two funders and we've had a lot of uh, benefits in kind from the, the, from the, the ALB partners and the, the leadership within the ALBs has changed in a number of cases, but the commitment has remained. And I've just been very grateful to all the parties in this room for their time, their, when they, for taking my calls, it's him again, and for supporting us whenever we've asked. And it, it has been that. Whenever we've asked, we've, we've received. And uh, that, that's been a pleasant, a, a, a pleasant finding, but a really important success factor. So I'm going to pause there. Uh, we, we thought Trudy might be a few minutes late, and she is, but that's fine, because uh, we are one of our first gigs, if not our first gig, so we'll let her off. So this is a chance for any comments or questions on anything we've said so far from the audience or from online. Any comments or questions? I was going to say it later, but shall I say a bit more about benchmarking? Please. Please. Thank you, David. It was a okay. uh, morning, everyone. Uh, some of you that were at the last conference will be, will be perhaps remember I said something like this then. But for me, um, one of the challenges we've had in construction is this idea that 
uh, the way you're going to ensure you've got value for money uh, on your project is to go out to tender and basically award it to the, to the lowest tender. Uh, you know, how many times have we come unstuck on that basis? Thank you. Yeah. So um, for, for me, the, 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 one of the key things about, about benchmarking is to really understand what we think our project is going to cost before we go out to tender. Um, and I, this was brought home to me uh, on a major project leadership academy course, sitting alongside uh, Ministry of Defence people. Um, and they explained to me that, uh, frankly, it isn't a competitive market in, in defence. Uh, you've got one or two suppliers. Therefore, the MOD put a huge amount of effort into benchmarking and understanding the cost of projects before they start. Now, you could say, well, uh, defence projects aren't exactly renowned for coming in on budget or on time. Um, I, I think I'd like to, to defend them and say that you know, often that's because of change of scope rather than not understanding what the original scope was going to cost. But I think we have got to get to that space in construction. We need to have a better understanding of what things are going to cost before we start. And on that basis, have confidence that we don't necessarily have to rely so much on a design and build approach, for example, to, to get the best price. Because if you look at these complex projects we're now delivering, uh, so much of it is actually determined by the client. It, they have no choice. You know, in the case of HS2, you're having to award the civil's contracts years ahead of the system's contracts because of the timescales, uh, uh, etc. But you know, you've, you've got to have decided what sort of systems you want uh, before then. And, and therefore, you know, the, the clients need to actually accept they've got much more responsibility for the design. And on that basis, the more we can benchmark and, and understand what things ought to cost and should cost, and if we you know, change some things, what, how much we can reduce the cost, the better. Hope that helps. David, thank you very much. And the uh, impact of that, I'm going to ask Darren James for a comment on this in a minute, but the impact of that, one of the things we found in our what works is often the supply chain, the return on investment for lots of these things. We've talked about the benefits, but the time to get those benefits is typically more than 15 months. Many of them will be two, three, four year investment ROIs, right? So that's quite normal, quite calm. If the supply chain can only see 18 months ahead, then th it's not rational for them to invest in these things. And then you're, you're putting the, the onus on the clients for the investment and of course, in, in, a, in a world of constrained public resources, that's not necessarily going to be the best approach. Now, Dan, you, you and I have talked about that question quite a lot in a, around the, the rail supply group as part of the, the sector deal, the rail sector deal. Uh, what's your experience of that? Is that right? Well, I think uh, you're referring to the piece of work we did on the visibility of the, of the, the, the work pipeline, which was um, an initiative that was um, spearheaded by the RSG but fantastically supported, I think now by 370 signatories to the Charter. And, and the reason that it was sort of important that we got it out of the visibility was crucial, is quite often the, the, the clever uh, tricks in terms of the equipment and the, and, the, and the methodology come from tier two and three suppliers. And, and they need the, the visibility much further in advance to be able to invest, because if I go back, and one of the examples that were cited was when we went for the National Electrification Plan, you know, we just had to put up with the supply chain that existed and the equipment that existed. Whereas the right way to do it was to have been invested long time before that in better equipment that was you know, far more efficient. So for me, there's loads of evidence that when you can see a uh, pipeline ahead of you, you can engage the, the broader supply chain earlier. They will invest in skills and equipment that is in, inherently more productive than if you just started from, from scratch. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So the, the importance of that long term and then today should have introduced both David and Dan. David, senior civil servant, DFT, responsible for all of this policy area. Darren, formerly of Costain, now of uh, Kelpbury and uh, as, as, as mentioned, very leading at the, the RSG project. So what we what we and the the, uh, the the forward thinking that can come, the confidence to have longer procurements that comes from the benchmarking will be one of the things, and we, we saw that in energy as well. 
We've been told that the Minister's going to be just a few minutes more, so I'm going to start the round table now. So, uh, and, and the format for that is that we, we, we ask difficult questions and you ask difficult questions. So I'm going to move over here and uh, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves first of all. So uh, I'm going to go in traditionally to the left. So Mark, please introduce yourself to our audience. So good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Reynolds. I am the Group Chairman and Chief Executive of MACE, and I'm recently the co-chair, appointed co-chair for the Construction Leadership Council. Thank you, Mark. Nick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nick Smord, uh, Chief Executive of the Infrastructure and Projects Authority. Thank you. Sue. Sue Kershaw, Managing Director of Transportation Costain and President of the Association for Project Management. Thank you. Sam. Uh, Sam Stacey, Challenge Director for the Transform and Construction Programme. Thank you, Sam. Mike. Good morning. So I'm Mike O'Hare, Commercial Delivery Director at HS2 for the stations. Thank you. Darren, you can introduce yourself more responsibly than, <coughs> than, than uh, I did. Darren James, the Chief Executive of the Calpray Group. Thank you. Uh, Adam Simmons from National Highways. I'm the Director with Responsibility for uh, developing our next road investment strategy. Thank you, Adam. Stuart. Good morning, everybody. I'm Stuart Harvey. I'm the Chief Capital Officer for Transport for London. Good morning. Jeremy, um, Jeremy Damrell, I'm the Development Director for East West Rail. I'm very recently in post, Jeremy. We'll be gentle with you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Christian. Uh, good morning, all. Christian Irwin, I'm the Rail Investment Centre Excellence Director for Network Rail. Thank you. And Ed. Uh, Ed McCann, I'm President of the Institution of Civil Engineers and a Senior Director at Expedition Engineering. Uh, and when I, when I first uh, got involved with this project, everybody used to say, oh, you need to talk to Ed. Uh, Ed, what, Ed's the guy, you need to speak to him. Ed's the guy, he knows about this stuff. Okay. So, Ed, it's great to have you on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so we've got some uh, questions we thought you might want to help us with. So, the, <laughs> the first one's probably the hardest. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to give the panel the chance to volunteer to answer it, or I'm going to pick on people, because that's mm -hmm. what happens. And Trudy will behave much better when she's here, so I'll behave badly while she's not. So how can the construction sector switch its focus from lowest economic cost towards greater social value? Okay, so David was warming us up for that. And we're going to have a go at that? I'm going to Jeremy, start you thank you. I'm going to start you off, because um, I was keen to share with you the work we've been doing around target state. Um, so what we've been doing is considering uh, what the railway what our railway will look like in 2037. So we picked a notional time in the future and we've looked from the customer's perspective, so a customer-centric approach. Um, and we've built a headline around that, um, which very much sets the basis for everything that we then do. So focusing on, on the how, so how we deliver um, an excellent customer service as opposed to what or, or um, sort of what stations we require. So thinking in a strategic way rather than a tactical way um, from the customer's perspective, as, as I say. Um, and what that's allowed us to do is to organise our, um, our business from that, uh, from that perspective. So we're, we are setting up projects to deliver aspects of the railway, uh, which are collaborative, multifunctional, uh, rather than perhaps a more traditional approach where an engineer t engin engineering team might de deliver an infrastructure solution, an operations team might pick that up and decide it isn't quite what they wanted. Um, so it's not, that sounds quite revolutionary, but you know, in other, in other sectors, starting with the customer is probably quite normal. Yeah, I guess what's different about it, because the obvious question is, isn't that benefits realisation? And it is, but it's plus plus. Yeah. Um, so it's starting with that end in mind rather than starting with a preconception of what that solution is and then backfilling benefits to that and it gives us a golden thread uh, which we can continually refer back to which is then of course it's efficient um, and um, it keeps people on track and it makes sure that we are delivering to that outcome so i kind of i was can you share that in terms of social value it's me thank you excellent you, you didn't address the first part of the question but we, you're off the hook because the minister's here <laughs> Today, you're very welcome thank you so much for coming one of your first gigs in your new role i would imagine 
The, the first. The first guest. So yeah. thank you so much for coming here. I'm sorry to bring you so far east. My old chairman, Mike Brown, used to brainwash me every day and said, Neil, you've got, uh, you're a dinosaur, you don't understand. The centre of gravity of London is moving east. So we, I've followed his advice and he's rebuilding Parliament, apparently. So, uh, Single-handedly. No, I think he's got, I think he's got help. Uh, Trudy, thank you very much. Congratulations on your promotion. I was going to tell the audience about your your portfolio, but it would take too take too long. It's quite an intimidating portfolio, but we know you care about the things that we care about, which is about how to get greater social value and uh, better bang for our buck from increasing transport uh, investment. And your government has been fantastic at investing in, in transport infrastructure. So you're well placed and you've been around for a while before you got this new role and you're very well placed to say a few words for us. And then we've put together a, a brainy audience and a brainy panel and uh, we thought you might want to ask them some difficult questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Um, given that it is very early days for me and to sum up in a nutshell, the role, it's essentially decarbonisation across, tra across transport, the future of transport, walking, cycling and space travel, in addition to the major projects, so all of what you're doing here. Um, very exciting, uh, personal interest, because I do live in West Cumbria, so I endure the West Coast main line twice a week um, and absolutely understand the need for the significant investment in transport. My team have helped put together some words, so I am going to follow the script to some extent and then really look forward to asking the questions. Getting costs down, getting nature up is certainly one of my personal priorities, um, but really it's thanks to the organisers for inviting me here today so early on. It's, it's a real pleasure to learn about um, the Ties Living Lab and the conference here in particular. The challenges have been daunting, as I'm sure you all agree, and disruptive as COVID-19 over the past couple of years has been a part of, amongst other things. So I'm incredibly grateful to everybody in this room because you have all played a part in keeping us on track as far as possible despite these challenges. And the TIES programme really is delivering as far as I understand at the moment, with great success. I was briefed yesterday by the team. When my great colleague and friend, Andrew Stevenson, launched TIES Living Lab in 2020, he outlined the three core objects, essentially accelerating the innovation, improving the approach to data measures and metrics, and also improving the business process, making sure that the investment cases of consistent metrics for driving the innovation and also the wider societal benefits. We know that TIES partners are absolutely leading the change into how we deliver infrastructure, bringing together the clients and the suppliers and asking them to work differently to accelerate the innovation. We all appreciate the barriers to innovation are long-standing and incredibly complex, cultural, technical and also interdependent. And so it's only by working as a single team, despite the competitiveness, I'm sure, of your companies, across supply chains and across client bodies, that we can swiftly overcome them. It's a collaborative approach and it's created better understanding of what we need to do to control infrastructure costs, improve delivery performance, and identify the innovations and also strengthen delivery. It is this work that makes Living Lab so important. And we've all got a part to play in meeting the challenges and opportunities for accelerating infrastructure delivery today and in the future. I know that getting this right really matters. I'm under incredible pressure from colleagues to do so. And I would also like to set out why um, it matters for the wider public. Because we're investing £650 million pounds in infrastructure over the coming decade and at the core of this investment is an ambition to build back better across the whole country. The priorities as a department are to grow and level up the economy, improve transport for the user, reduce environmental impacts, increase our global impact and continue to be an excellent department and you may have been following who I am supporting. I was a big supporter of Grant uh, Shapps 
with his withdrawal and paying close attention now to all contenders and they would all support what I'm saying here. It's common sense. It's absolutely what every leader of this great country would want to do. So I don't think we need to pay too much attention to these distractions of the leadership contest because our priorities as a department are going to grow and levelling up the economy, improving that transport will always be the priority. Indeed, improving connectivity right across the United Kingdom and delivering projects that are on time, on budget, and putting the needs and expectations of passengers at the very heart of transport. So it does mean building greener and cleaner, more sustainable alternatives, because we know right now that the sector is our biggest contributor to greenhouse gases. And we're also on a, way, a world stage. I had the privilege of standing on the 10th of November at COP26 across many platforms. The world is watching what we're doing and we have to be credible. We have to demonstrate how decarbonising the transport sector, getting these projects right, is possible whilst also growing the economy. It's really essential that government focuses on these outcomes when we're choosing where and how we in government intervene in the complex infrastructure systems. Of course you're not doing this alone. It's enabling other key government policies such as transport <coughs> infrastructure performance roadmap and the construction playbook. And alongside the work of ties, these policies challenge government to rewire its decision making and its processes in order to embed greater respect for nature. Better data sharing, greater safety and security for our society and a more effective long-term partnership with the private and voluntary sectors. Many of these reforms will be implemented by other government departments in the industry. And so it's a shared endeavour that Living Lab is helping the whole of government deliver. Later, we'll be hearing from Nick Smallwood, CEO of the Infrastructure Projects Authority and the IPA play a vital role in coordinating government's response to how we transform our infrastructure performance. And Nick has kindly offered to say a few words this afternoon on the government's vision and progress to date. Events like these are a brilliant way to put our heads together, to take stock of our progress. And oh my goodness, I have really enjoyed the HS2 YouTube videos that my team have been sending me. I really think we have a way to go to persuade the public, including my own four daughters who are aged 19, 20, 22 and 24 and husband, about the great value of our investments in construction and infrastructure because it is so exciting. And this has been the greatest privilege thus far in this role, to get under the bonnet to really see what we're doing across the country and how the innovation and engineering, the machines that we are investing in are making this possible. So I do want to talk about progress. I want to take stock of that progress and where we're improving infrastructure delivery and to discuss what more we can do collaboratively to drive better social outcomes and greater efficiency savings because getting it right will mean better connectivity, more jobs, more investment and more economic opportunity right across the country. So we're going to start by talking about the Network Rail Footbridge programme, driving a cost reduction of 25% with delivery times reduced by 65%. The TFL Signal Room programme is driving a cost reduction of 60% with a delivery time reduction of 75%. And the automation programme for designing cables, driving a 99% reduction, I had to double check that figure in design time and crucially removing risk to sa staff safety. The cooling plant panel programme is driving savings of £1.9 million per TFL platform lifetime and almost a 20% increase in their train frequencies. The Intelligent Infrastructure Control System programme has already <coughs> demonstrated its work with data, driving a 30% reduction in on-site machine carbon emissions with potential for billions of cost savings if it's used more widely by the industry. So this, use, this list is not exhaustive, but it gives a sense of the efficiency savings that the live lab is driving. 
I am going to cut to the chase here yeah. because really it's about improving data, it's about measures and it's metrics. And I think the most valuable part of me being here is getting to know you, your companies, and what your um, ideas are, what your thoughts are, in how better we can collaborate. My goodness, this goes on and on. <laughs> so final thoughts. I'm clear that government will only deliver its infrastructure priorities by working shoulder to shoulder with other government departments, the IPA, our claim bodies and their supply chains. So, as I say, we're asking you to think about it, work with me, work with my department, enable that collaboration to do the right thing, to reduce the costs, to improve our reputation on the world stage of how we do infrastructure. And if we can increase wildlife biodiversity and tree planting whilst we do it, then I will be an incredibly happy Major Projects Minister. Thank you very much indeed. Judy, thank you for these very encouraging words and we, I think we'll be able to, to help you with a lot of your agendas there, maybe not space travel, but we might, we might touch on that, but yes, I think those, those questions, and before you came in the room, I was, uh, I was quite glad you weren't there because I, I was, I was, you'd be cross with me, but I was, I was saying I felt that the, the carbon agenda w was a, a risk to the project because I was the boring PMO for it, so we, we were very task focused. But actually what we've been finding is that the cost savings and carbon savings are very closely related. Now, people will say, Neil, that was obvious, but it wasn't obvious to me. But that's been a really happy thing. So we, we, we are now seeing that the relationship between the two is, is a close one. So it's now the chance for you to ask questions to our colleagues or our audience and for, for the audience to ask colleagues indeed of you and the, the panel. Would you like to start off for? I would be delighted. And essentially, the first question is lessons learned. What have you learned from your own experience of driving greater societal value and efficiencies um, and, and being as specific as possible? If you can explain some of the scenarios, that's always helpful for me. Um, but really, it's a question to all of you. So I assume we're uh, going to take these questions with hands up unless it's been pre-organised. No, it's not pre-organised, but, but we, we might want to pick on some people to warm us up. Stuart Harvey might be a good person to start us off on that. Thanks, Stuart. Yep. Hey, it's picking on me. No, <laughs> I, I, the whole word collaboration to me is, is fundamental to what we're achieving in Tige, and, and, and you can see many examples of projects where collaboration didn't exist, and they always go wrong. Yeah, nearly always. And, and equally, you can see projects where there's great collaboration. I guess the Northern Ark Extension, which I'm incredibly proud of, had a, a developer um, and a contractor and, and TFL in the middle. And actually, to, to get through that, which was an extremely constrained work site, um, and to overcome the issues just demonstrates that you're working together with common objectives, trying to all get the, the lowest cost, quickest outcome is a real good focus. So, so you know. It, of course it's an obvious statement, but I do start there because we have to think about that. So yeah, I, so I start there as a, as a thanks. Can I, can I just not put up with that? Can no. I just ask, how has collaboration, how did it come about? You've got commercial interests as individual companies, you could be competitors. So how do you overcome that, recognising the greater good? And can you just give me any examples? Um, hopefully to share with the room that would be enlightening. Can, well, can I jump in here? So, so um, the Transforming Construction Programme has been uh, implementing change for, for the industry and, and looking to address the market failures with a bit of uh, financial support and really impelling uh, all the, the stakeholders involved in delivery of transport infrastructure or whatever uh, to work together and you know the money that we provided to do that has kind of you know overcome some of the barriers with regards to reluctance perhaps uh, to, to collaborate so you know I think that's been a, I think so far that's been a really important lesson it was part of the rules that we laid down he said you have to collaborate now the effects of that have been absolutely terrific. You've, you know, you've seen all these statistics of the improvements. We absolutely know that we can make these improvements. The, the challenge, I think, going ahead from here as transforming construction uh, comes to an end is you know, to keep up that momentum um, where there isn't, certainly in the same way, that, that um, grant funding and financial support 
coming in from government. But, you know, I think we've given confidence to everybody that these things are, are feasible. And it's absolutely, uh, it doesn't require that injection of, of grant funding to make these things work. The, the logic is all there. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, that's the, the lesson and also the, the, the call to action from this. We've got supply chain leaders here as well, Minister. Maybe Mark would like to comment on, does it feel like that to you? Um, I'm going to be contradictory a little bit here. I actually think we're answering the wrong question to begin with. Uh, and Jeremy, forgive me, Jeremy used to work with, I used to work with Jeremy, so it's not an issue. We uh, have a go and vice versa. But um, I think we want to start with why we're doing this. And the, all of this great work's going on. We, we're engineers at heart. So we've all started with the engineering solution. But actually, High Speed 2, 20 minutes to Birmingham, was that the best sell? What was High Speed 2 really ge generating? It was generating, you know, regeneration across the country. It was enabling levelling up. Didn't realise that. It started off with the wrong why. If you look at the Olympic Park, it started off with the legacy and as well as the games. And if you look at it, 20 years on really from where it started you can now see 40,000 homes jobs regeneration complete regeneration of what was disused railhead uh, sidings fridge mountain where the aquatic center sits I mean it was a pretty horrible nasty site of uh, some real uh, regeneration it's um, enabled over the last years I want to go on to the point about why we're all aligned uh, at the end of the day People want to earn money. Whether you're an individual going to work, getting a decent paid job to a company that wants to grow and invest and do the right thing. So we've got to try and appeal to all of those, which is why collaboration only works when you understand the flow of money and the flow of risk. So we've got to make sure we're doing all that. The stuff that uh, uh, Sam just mentioned around collaboration and ties, as companies all doing it for the right thing, are they all making money out of it? Not necessarily. But we're investing for the future. So we need to make sure that the flow of the money is aligned from right from the strategic outset, or what, to the why, right the way through to the how and the what. And then we can make that work. And we should be honest with ourselves. If we've got it wrong, let's have a chat because we're all amongst friends here. We can work this through. So, but if it doesn't work for client or government or society then, and, it, and it doesn't work for the people actually doing the work we're going to fail so my request would be make sure it's fully joined up um, don't get too tactical in some areas challenge yourselves on the tactics and, and just think big so it's not fully joined up at the moment is what I'm we've worked before haven't we Mark? we met at the Rolls Royce dinner ah right okay can I just add to, I, mean, I actually think that what has gone on here and since we did meet that dinner is that you know transport is fighting for funding and at the moment I reckon you're third or fourth in the line energy security housing and then transport and if you don't recognize that what value you can offer then you're going to be in trouble with ministers I reckon so my advice would be champion what you're doing champion Absolutely. big I agree with you yeah can i maybe build on something that mark said and, and jeremy said before you joined the room <clears throat> one of the key lessons that we're learning on those projects that are truly successful is they're very clear on the outcomes what does success look like and it's not about building a railway from a to b it's building a railway from a to b in order to and then thinking of all the societal issues that are in that what are you going to do about economic growth? What are you going to do about cycleways connecting to the railway? You know, I, I lived for 11 years in the Netherlands, and the cycle racks at the stations are bigger than the car parts. And they've been building on that for the last 20 years. If you ever, go, I, I suggest you Google Amsterdam uh, Central Station, it'll blow you away if you look at the number of bikes outside. I don't think that society will accept just doing what we've always done. They will expect you to come with a biodiversity plan, they'll expect you to come with a net zero plan. If you don't need to build something because you've benchmarked it and done it cheaper, it's for free, by the way. So I think, you know, the, the, there's some complementary goals, but if you aren't articulating everything you're gonna do up front, you just do it on the fly as you go, 
you'll get late changes, you'll get frustrated customers, you'll get frustrated citizens, you'll probably get planning challenges. So I think it's incumbent on us to really reset how are you going to do some of these highly complex projects. And I look at HS2 and it is a fabulous project, but they've undersold the good things, totally, totally undersold them. And, and that message is missing in the public eye. So we've got more to do in setting up what are the outcomes in the broadest possible sense from the get-go. It's harder at the beginning. I always call it front-end loading. You know, you really have to think through all that difficult stuff up front. And if you do, my experience is you'll build quicker, faster, better, greener. And Minister, it sounds Why like you're going to hold people to that, doesn't it? <laughs> Ultimately, I will be your greatest champion in Parliament and across the country, but I need the information about what you're doing and how it's impacting on people's lives and livelihoods. So that is what I'm trying to grip, get to grips with at the moment. And I think you're absolutely right, Nick. It has been, to me, as a parliamentarian, undersold. Hmm. Now getting to understand the number of apprenticeships, yeah. I mean, fantastic reasons to celebrate these major projects and be proud of the investment so far and the brave and bold decisions that have been taken by politicians and others before me. Um, so, a couple more questions. <coughs> Where do we see collaboration between client organisations as driving the greatest efficiency savings within infrastructure delivery? Um, and part of it for me is understanding where the um, synergies are where the procurement of cement or particular types of steel or footbridges, as I was hearing about, is. Um, and what is the process to really understand that in a time frame that works for the individual companies? I may have led you down a completely um, wrong path there, but that is how I kind of understand the question in terms of driving those greatest efficiencies. Can we hear from you, Sue? Certainly can. Thank you very much. Uh, two things on this. One is in terms of procuring things differently, which is really important to me because we have a very outdated, inefficient procurement system, but out of nothing, Network Rail has come along on CP7 Southern and said, no, we're going to use Project 13, which is all about collaboration and the bigger intent, the capable client. And we're going to bring the supply chain along with us before we even know what we want. So we're working with them hand in hand over it's going to be about a year scope out what they want and who they think is best to do it and they're doing this through a collaborative uh, dialogue mm -hmm. so you know there's there's nothing on paper it's all like let's talk about what we want in southern the southern region going forward how we're going to do it how it's going to uh, impact on the people locally and how we can bring them in all of that stuff in the round and this is revolutionary I've, I've worked in this business a long time and Network Rail of all my clients was the last one I thought we'd do this. So if there's anyone from Network Rail here today, congratulations, because they've nailed it. And we've been on behavioural assessments with them, and that room is full of complete energy. Everyone wants to work together to be part of it. And I think that's absolutely incredible, mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. And, and I think also the social value piece, going to your point on let's do things smarter. Post-Brexit, we've got to look at regionalisation. You know, I've got five major road projects in the northeast. So what are we doing? We've got a hub in the middle. It's got its own materials lab, it's got its own logistics centre. It's, it's working out for all those five projects. And those people that live in the northeast can see they have a future for 10 years. For the first time ever, it's not, I'll do this project and then this one, and I'll go all the way down to the southwest and the southeast. No, you, you've got a lot <coughs> from the northeast. It's fabulous. Oh, that is so fabulous. And I know Andrew Stevenson, who's a great friend, was so passionate about the apprenticeships and skills. And, um, you know, that, that was something that he talked so often, so proudly about that were being created by these major projects. And I think you're absolutely right. And I also think if we look at, for example, Jaguar Land Rover, mm -hmm. an anchor company, uh, Warwick Manufacturing Centre, but also not just rolling out the training opportunities for people in their company, but recognising the wider benefits of support and um, social workers mm -hmm. and other people that need to make a sustainable community. Because the challenges in the North East are not just lack of jobs in one particular area, it is a social and cultural offer. It's of course many things. So the more that we can use these major projects to support other sectors, I think the better. 
where it works for the project. So any other ideas on those efficiencies? Yeah, I've, I've got a few more P's for you, having heard about procurement. Um, this, this idea of people is really important, and I think there, there, there's a couple of ways of cutting it. You started talking about the problem with the population. And, and, and in essence, you can say that the UK population thinks that infrastructure is done to them, not for them, God forbid, with them. And we have to completely turn that around. There's no way you talked about energy and housing. How are we going to do energy? How are we going to rewire the country for a net zero grid? Ripping up high streets, putting wind turbines away. We need the population to understand how critical infrastructure is to their lives. We need to do it in a way that touches lightly on planet Earth, as you say. So there's a, there's a huge job of work, and you asked about collaborating as clients, and clients need to collaborate. We all need to collaborate about messaging into the population consistently, clearly, and honestly about the essential things that we must do to uh, to enable the infrastructure to exist. So that's those people, the people we're working for. But then there's the people who are us. And you talked about the skills of apprentices, but we've got to rewire the professional classes as well. I represent the Institution of Civil Engineers. We've got nearly 100,000 members, the vast majority of whom work in this world of, of providing the infrastructure. And they need a reboot. Frankly, they need a reboot about the emerging agenda. They need to be focused on continuous improvement, using technique and technology to improve efficiency and so on. So there's two dimensions to people there I would mention. I was then going to say that common <coughs> processes, so it's a big and complex system that we work in. However, in many respects, what we do is repeatedly ap apply common processes. So you can say HS2 is the most complicated infrastructure in the world, yada, 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 or you can say it's six things we do quite a lot. We do a lot of earthworks, we do a lot of tunnels, we do a lot of bridges, we do a lot of stations, we buy a few trains. And if you put that optic on it, you think about the problem rather differently. How do I do earthworks better? What is it that I would do to transform the efficiency with which we construct and uh, form earthworks? And so I think collaborating as we're starting to see, so highways, uh, national highways, network rail, starting to talk to each other, go, okay, we all buy a lot of concrete. What can we do with the common process of not just buying it, but turning it into low carbon concrete and designing and delivering and so on. So I would say collaborate on high impact common processes and HS2 has done some great work identifying what these common processes are. And the final one is a product optic. So you've noticed the four P's I've given here. For procure. <laughs> anyway, so the fourth one is products. And a lot of what the, the Ties Living Lab has done, certainly the Footbridge project, which I know intimately because we are working on it, um, the, uh, the, it's about putting a product focus on things. So for instance, manholes. If you look at manholes, um, I, I don't know if anyone has seen any evolution in the manhole product in their working lives. I certainly haven't. It's like we found the perfect way to do a manhole in 1947 and just sat back. That's not how it should work. What we should be doing is looking at the things we make a lot of, whether they're road signs or they're station copers and trestles and line side buildings and all of these things which we do by the bucket load. We need to isolate them as products and put them through product evolution methodology that manufacturing has done so well. If we do it that way around, so if you focus on them, those P's, in my view what you are then doing is applying the well-established continuous improvement methodologies that we have seen in manufacturing around the application of technology, the use of data, the deployment of digital, process control, skill development, into those processes, products and people's stories to generate the productivity improvements that we so desperately need. And I, I would say, so my final thing is I, I can see it working. I'm seeing it working. I'm involved in several of these things. When you do this diligently, when you get the collaboration between the clients, common focus and so on, it really, really does work. And so I'm, I'm very confident sitting here saying that that's, that's for me, the route map to improve uh, productivity. There we are. I think that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to bring you in in just a moment, but I, I feel a need to be more involved um, in order to be that greatest champion. So I'm also keen to, you know, have regular understanding of exactly those opportunities and also to see how I can draw other aspects of my other roles, hydrogen use, for example, in non-road going transport, um, obviously the biodiversity. So. I certainly want to work much more closely um, going forwards to deeply understand what those opportunities are and make them happen. I was just going to build on what everyone said actually. We need contractor collaboration, we need client contractor collaboration because unless we understand each other you know, and, and set the risk profile 
correctly. Too often we, we talk a lot and then we just try and transfer risk in an incorrect way. And our bank project, which so is not as good as what you're talking about, but it was a start to try and really understand with the supply chain what could be achieved and then work together. So if you go to that project, you don't know who works for the supply, you don't know who works for the client, it's not obvious. So yeah, I think we need to really understand that. We need the pipeline, as, as Mark said and others said, because we've got to generate that long-term trust and collaboration. Um, so without that pipeline, we're not going to build that, that opportunity. Mm. That kind of certainty as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. that you can see what's coming. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Um, Adam Simmons from National Highways. I, I wanted to share a couple of examples with you. First, about collaboration between us as a client and, and our suppliers, and then your question about collaboration between client organisations. Uh, recent major renewals work on the A590 up in, in Cumbria. Um, really good where the team, the National Highways and the Supplier team, really challenged itself to deliver that um, by halving the amount of construction carbon. Actually, it was very much driven by the graduate cohort amongst the, the, the different organisations involved there. So kind of really kind of um, you know, encouraging that, that enablement from, from that younger generation come through. So sort of doing that, we had on-site batching to reduce lorry movements, that obviously reduces carbon, but also reduces the impact on, on our neighbours by stopping those lorry movements through through, um, through constituencies. Um, having solar power generation to generate renewable energy to power the site office and, and site vehicles. Uh, recycling materials back into the next part of the, of the project. So again, reducing lorry movements, <coughs> reducing needing to quarry out fresh sort of materials. Um, and I think most recently, I think the first use of, uh, I've heard it called biogenic asphalt. I'm not sure it's necessarily it's sort of a proper technical name, but uh, a, a product which kind of locks in the carbon rather than release it into the, into the atmosphere. So kind of that's a, a sort of project there through that collective and collaborative shared ambition to drive a huge amount of in innovation. Um, I think then to the, your, your challenge of between client organisations, um, I think already we're starting perhaps in some sort of small specific areas, but National Highways are doing some work to look at uh, power generation on some of our um, uh, structures and, 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 and and we've been working with Network Rail to think about how that can be applied to um, a, a rail environment. Um, seemingly sort of mundane but really important one, we talked about earthworks and, and sort of that side of things. Um, how we share our solutions for retaining walls and how that might apply to, to high speed too. Um, I'd really echo some of the points that they made about perhaps that next step and I think the point you touched on ministers. I think how we, you know, where a lot of us use concrete and steel in particular, how perhaps not necessarily one client organisation leads on getting a, a low and zero carbon product there, but I think how we can at least avoid duplication <coughs> and we're not all trying to do the same sort of thing and, and find a way to, to build on these relationships to work together. So well, National Highways might focus on this element of lower carbon steel, that rail and perhaps that element and then share those. And I think as we, as we're all standards driven and of course it's really important from a safety perspective that we meet those standards, I think collectively making the case that new product can be used um, in, in sort of a greater um, um, sort of range of applications is really important. So we're not all individually making the case for lower carbon steel to be using you know, heavy load bearing structures. But we can collectively share that case and collectively build a safety case together. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mike and then Christian and then we'll move on to the next question. Thank you, Minister. So, I, I perhaps I'd just like to give three examples where I think in H2 we've really tried to build that collaborative approach. I'm like short step. So, one would be at Euston, where we've got this tremendously complex project. And I think initially what you had was a lot of different interests in there, thinking about their own interests. So, people like HS2, Network Rail, Transport for London, Camden Council, very complex. They were thinking about each other's, but there was perhaps more that could be done. So this Houston partnership was formed that had everybody there together with the department involved also, which I think is still finding its feet a little bit, but it does provide a, a single um, organisation that's there to provide the, the right answer for Houston. I think that's a, a really positive thing. So that would be one. I think the second thing, come back to perhaps one of Mark's point earlier about trying to get the, the commercial arrangements right so the money flows in the right direction. I mean, we'll try to do that a little bit at Houston um, with, with um, Mark's organisation and, and other organisations there where everybody's mutually incentivised with trying to get the very best outcome. It's not always easy to do, um, but we, we certainly do try to do it and, and I think also try and have some of those 
collaborative cultures that means even when people aren't commercially absolutely aligned, you talk about it and you deal with it professionally to come up with the right solution for everybody. And I think the third thing I'll say is, is where we have realised HS2 that um, there are benefits of working with the other arms length bodies to, to do certain things. So for example, when it comes to buying rail for HS2, network rail are pretty good at buying rail and there doesn't seem to be that much point of us going to buy rail separately to network rail. So we just work with network rail to be part of their procurements of buying rail. And equally, we'll say Old Oak Common in West London, where there's work on the conventional station, as well as the HS2 station there. We work with network rail and, and work with their procurements and their supply chain to deliver the bits that they're best at doing. Uh, so I think a lot of that is happening. Are those examples really helpful to me, I'm sure to everybody, to appreciate the difference that it's made? So thanks, thanks for that, Mike. Ed? No, Christian. Christian. Sorry, <laughs> Ed, somewhere. No, that's fine. Um, so, um, good morning. We, um, I think it's the second time I've had a chance to meet you because I actually met you in April in Truro County Hall with Cornwall Council where I had the opportunity to take you through a big Cornwall Metro concept about cross-Cornwall connectivity. You did indeed. Yeah, and, and so I just want to just uh, build on, on some of the points that the panel have, have said about and I want to come back to your first question about lessons learned around delivering greater social value. So I think we've just talked about, about how the Ties Programme Living Lab has really helped us kind of generate innovation. We've talked through the project innovation, but it's done more than that. It's bonded a whole host of organisations in a collaborative way. Mm -hmm. It's developed an area and an element of trust, and that trust has brought honesty, and that honesty has enabled problems to be shared and also problems to be solved. But one of the other things it's really helped stimulate is a mindset change, a cultural change across the construction industry. And this links very closely to what we're doing in Network Rail, which is the reference to Project Speed, a joint Network Rail and DFT ambition to deliver projects more efficiently and, more, um, and quicker. But the mindset piece comes back very quickly to me is that why? Why are we investing in rail? And too often we are focused very much on how many bridges we put in, how many kilometres of the track, how much ballast are we going to do? We don't just focus on what is the physical infrastructure. But if we ask the question about why, and you link it back to the construction playbook, which is what is the outcome we are trying to achieve? Why are we investing in this project? <coughs> and if you can really define why are we investing in this project? What is it we are hoping to achieve? What is the outcome we intend to deliver? And I'll just play back on, a, on an example of a, a, a slightly smaller rear railway line we're reopening, but the Dartmoor line, which opened um, last year, um, a very, very quick under project speed in less than nine months. The outcome led specification there was, how do we connect, reconnect a lost community and provide economic growth? That was the challenge. And that really started to make us think differently. It's actually, let's not think necessarily about these as infrastructure projects. Let's think about these as community development projects. And that collaboration between partners is brilliant. Collaboration between the supply chain is absolutely essential. But collaboration with the communities that we are investing in is so fundamental to adding social value. And that great example on the Dartmoor line about how we invested significant amount of time in developing a pure partnership between the local authorities, three of them involved, the Dartmoor National Park, the local supporters association, the town councils, and Network <coughs> Rail and the great and the train operator, that we had this perfect partnership that put forward under one banner. <coughs> and that is where we built that social value at the very front end of the project. What is it that we want to achieve before we go and start thinking about what are the nuts and bolts we need to piece together. And that, that if you can get your outcome-led specification absolutely right, that not only helps you make sure you deliver the best social value, but it can help you drive what we call minimum viable product. So how do you deliver the least amount of scope to achieve your outcome? And, and really that is where we are really starting to focus our efforts on about how do we strive to deliver greater social value, but how do we actually help that to drive cost and time efficiency, which is so essential because every percent we can save on a project is another element of investment we can put elsewhere. So that's just something I really wanted to share, but I, I think absolutely that the support through this network we've created through Living Lab and Ties, the ability to solve some of the things that we're not good at, and a great example of, of, of Highways uh, England supporting us very much on our carbon journey is a, is a really great example of that. Brilliant. Music yeah. to my ears, Christian. Can I just say something to that? Because I think the uh, Christian's picked up a, a relevant point which we don't always understand and, and perhaps government do better. So when we talk about economic development, you know, economic growth, what does that really mean? And is it, you know, 
a figure got thrown at me a few years ago that you're not an economic contributor unless you earn more than £30,000 a year. Now, how many people in Dartmoor earn more than £30,000 a year? Probably not many. Okay. So, you know, how do we, is that the right measure? Are we measuring the right things? And I just think sometimes that we go off do this, we talk with nice glib language to say, yeah, we're all giving economic growth and actually all we're doing is actually creating economic deficit. So I do think that there needs to be some realism, so I go back right at the start, what are we trying to achieve here? And it might be a less of economic deficit, as long as we know that, then we can actually put the, you know, the right mechanism in place. And I go back to some work we do, you know, we all do charity work, so you know, I was involved with a, uh, a housing, uh, homeless charity, and it was how do we create as many bed spaces for a little sum as money as possible to keep people off the street safe and secure. And you know, our challenge wasn't to spend thirty thousand pound per bed. It was how do we spend ten thousand pound a bed? And, and they were really simple metrics. And suddenly, we were able, when we got that down to the metrics at that level, <coughs> we were able to drive some real benefit. And it, and it just multiplied and multiplied. So we went from you know what we thought was five hundred to three thousand for the same reason you just said. So I do think there is a there's an element of big picture work that the government has to their in their armoury that we perhaps don't understand. Well, it leads nicely on to the question of scaling because the roadmap, the construction playbook you've all referenced, um, clearly they have had an impact. But what do we need to do collectively to scale up on the benefits of what's already happened? And I'm looking for jobs here, direction, so don't be shy. Um, well, I have really good answers for the first two questions, but I missed my opportunity there. But um, one thing I was going to help you with, specifically on question two, Minister, you asked about you know, what are the clients doing? Well, there is an infrastructure client group, which I would strongly recommend that you, you let's say, you get yourself in attendance at the next session, which will, because the stuff that Sue talked about, the Project 13, the stuff we talked came out to there in some shape or form. Um, I probably yourself with a level of enthusiasm I've seen already in, in yourself that that would be a really positive spark again to a group that's got um, you know, like a Sellafielder in there, National Highways, they, 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 they procure large construction projects, mm -hmm. not just transport projects, and some good stuff. So there was, sorry, that was something you specifically asked for in the That's Q2. very helpful, thank you. In, in terms of scaling up, look, again, we've got tons of best practice. Uh, one of the things I'm working on at the moment is a productivity initiative with the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Rail Supply Group. And uh, one thing we did do is, is do some horizon scanning about what was going on already, and there's absolutely tons of stuff. We're all incredibly guilty of reinventing the wheel. So I say, I say one thing I would suggest is stamp out reinventing the wheel. There's tons of best practice to be had. There's, there's a couple of organs, that the clients represented today, they are all advocates of trying to do the right thing. Lessons learnt is a, is a huge thing. We've got plenty of opportunity to, 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 to learn lessons. Unfortunately, we learn some lessons and forget some other ones we'd learned before. Um, so for me, scaling up would be absolutely drive hard this lessons learned piece from all of the sort of infrastructure stroke big capital programs you can learn from the olympics you can learn from crossroad you can learn from smart motorways you can learn they've, they've all the stuff the thing we need to do is learn all the good lessons and package them all together um, and again i, you know, I cite outside our sector but, but sellafield have, have picked on and they've got 90 percent of it right in terms of what they're doing for their future program mm. um uh, and is the information available from, say, Southfield or the Olympics in order for other companies to learn from? And also, standardisation versus how do we become a, become a science superpower and an innovation nation if we're not, you know, cons consistently reinventing the wheel? So, again, um, I, I, I give you sort of a short answer to your question two. Your question one, by the way, you hit the nail on the head for question one. I think Mark picked up the Olympics too. One of the things I would say about your question one is, you know, what do we do to stimulate? And particularly yourself, is be clear what the outcomes and the objectives are and hardware through to some government policy because back to the, the classic of the high speed two, it was promoted as being the wrong type of solution when it's actually got some fantastic benefits. I think Crossway were quite good at how they presented the benefits of, 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 the, of the scheme. So that going back to the, the, the objective. But the data does exist. And again, the infrastructure client group, you know, you've got access to all of the relevant data there. And I've seen, again, I'm sure my colleagues will share, I've seen plenty of evidence where people are happy to share, you know, from the supply chain, which, 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 which I represent, you know, 
be proud and sharing and having someone pinch your good <coughs> ideas because you know, an organisation like that moves on with a far more innovative in advance. So, short answer, the data does exist. The clients have it and the supply chain is more than happy. There's plenty of forums. Myself and Mark were involved in particular, and I think Sue as well, when Crossroad 2, and I was maybe a little bit off, off now, but they were very early to go and set up a forum whereby, you know, how's it going halfway through Crossroad? And that was the right time to ask because, you know, we were seeing plenty of lessons learned there too. So there's, there's a culture there, and therefore I think a great uh, opportunity for you to benefit greatly from learning very quickly about what we can do. Brilliant, thank you. Lots of enthusiasm for this question, which is brilliant. Mike and then Adam. Yes, just uh, very quickly, and perhaps a bit specifically on the, sh the sharing of lessons. One thing that I think has been great, and I've personally benefited a lot from, are the learning legacies that have been set up by certain organisations. So the Olympics had a learning legacy, which has been fantastic. Crossrails had a learning legacy, which has been fantastic. And there's so much information put in the public domain for future projects to learn from on all aspects, mm -hmm. from the benefits to the engineering, to the commercial, to, to everything. Um, so they're, they're tremendous things. I'd really encourage that we do more of that actually um, and I've, from what I've also heard it's been really helpful for British industry to go forward in the world certainly some of the things we've done at HS2 I know some of our suppliers have said that they've benefited from what they've learned as they've gone to do business in Australia for example I'm on Sydney Metro so uh, I think there is stuff there and I, I think we should do more of it putting it out in the public domain yeah okay Adam thank you I so think of your challenge of, of, of scalability and, and where next um, I think building on a few points. I think certainly that's the um, point Mark was making earlier. The certainty of, of investment is a really great way to sort of foster that, that environment. And National Highway was only created in um, 2015, but shifting from annual investment to five year investment has kind of I think really, really sort of, um, sort of help accelerate all this in, in, in our side of the sector. Um, my reflection is then that transport has a real range of skills from uh, sort of labourer to then very sort of specialist um, skills. And I think the opportunity here is, um, we talked about avoiding duplication either from sort of learning the lessons and not reinventing the wheel, or um, sort of drawing particularly across sort of clients and um, client organisations and the supply chain to sort of find these solutions. I think creates a lot of those sort of jobs around that. So I think it creates quite a stable um, sector um, to draw in build innovation but draw people into that skill set. What I would also say is a real opportunity to look beyond transport. I think a lot of the, um, the carbon challenges we've got was brought something from highway sort of transport into the energy um, sector. And actually those sorts of collaborations as well we're already starting to, to do is national highways, certainly with the Department of Transport, the energy sector really thinking mm -hmm. about how we're providing the infrastructure say for electric vehicles and, mm -hmm. and that sort of direction of travel. So I think that that sort of building on the stability we've got in the sector, making the most of those collaborations to um, not tread on each other's toes, and that sort of creates a much broader sort of skill set for to encourage people into the sector, and then building on the, the, the sort of new collaborations with other sectors. I think there's some huge opportunities to really build on these collaborations now and scale it up. Yeah, and I've seen that Project Rapid, one great example of that, you know, minimum of six rapid charges in all of the 114 motorway service areas with National Highways as the partner and bringing in the private sector companies with particular specialisms as necessary. It's working really well from what I see is that the Minister responsible for that. Uh, so thanks, thanks for bringing that example. Um, Stuart. I'm going to be slightly less kind, just for effect. I think we were really good at identifying lessons. Brilliant. But mm -hmm. I'm not as convinced that in a consistent way we learn lessons. I think we've somehow got to incentivise you know, bodies to make bids based on demonstrating that they've learned lessons and truly implementing them and you know and that should that should go in your favour. I think that would drive a huge incentive to, to you know suck the information out and demonstrate it's been done. So as as an organisation that puts jobs out there for companies to tender to is there then an opportunity to require in that tender lessons learned from previous projects? Explain. Yeah, definitely. But I think I think clients need to learn lessons as well because you know I think it's sketchy, mm -hmm. it's improving. So somehow bringing that together. So how, you know, how can TFL learn everything? Network Wells on the vice versa and highways agency. It's sketchy. Yeah, it's much better than it was, but. I think there's an earnestness to come together and demonstrate we've done that and, and, and when we present to make cases for big major projects we absolutely prove that we've learned those lessons 
and you know, those organisations that do should be rewarded. Mm. It's a kind of honesty, isn't it, that yeah. Yeah. Um, if on a previous project something could have gone better if, talking about that, without being um, nervous that it's going to scupper your future tender success, it's pretty brave for a contractor to suggest that they could have done something better and this is what they would do going forward. Yeah, well, we, so we I've lost more jobs as I've got more senior by being honest. The number of suppliers that say to me, please let me be honest um, and you know, truly collaborative and tell you how you can do that better. And as you say, you know, Mark, we've got to reward that and not, oh, well, that's two points off. Um, we're going to turn it around. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a really good point that we should work on. And Ed mentioned earlier, Minister, the, the making things into a product. And part of what we've been doing living labs, so it's only part has been about trying to bring some of the discipline from the manufacturing sector who are very good at this. And they're very good at learning lessons and they have quality systems that allow them to do that. And transport infrastructure, not quite a quality free zone, but we're 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 on the early stages of that journey. So you were thinking, well, what would that look like? Well that you that would look like TFL having one of the quality badges that we would see uh, we'd expect to see absolutely normal. In, in advanced manufacture and Rolls Royce, you were at the dinner with, with Rolls Royce with, with someone. Uh, that was, you know, that's the sort of thing that they've been doing for years, and they, they 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 see the benefits in terms of, you know, when they're starting a new thing, they don't start with a blank sheet of paper. It's ninety percent there, so they've learned all that is scientific learning of lessons. So there are places to look. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yes, yeah, so I, I was going to say, I think. Um, to, to scale this stuff up, um, we, we, we need to organise what's a very, very complicated ecosystem with some pretty bad habits, actually. And, and it falls to uh, some of the uh, more potent three-letter acronym organisations that float around in this space to convene, in my view, to pull together um, the various factions, parts and, and experiences across, uh, across You're making my lines, you are. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, but it is, it's interesting at the moment, there are a few of them that are playing a key role, I mean TLC obviously, IPA, uh, and we need to not, we need to agree to distribute the effort and play to our respective strengths. Um, uh, speaking for the ICE, um, we're 200 years old, we are about capturing best practice and making sure that people adopt it that in a sense is, is, is in the DNA we're not necessarily very good at it, and I think you're absolutely right I think we're very good at writing well occasionally we write the stuff down actually going out and finding it and doing what you're talking about about making the next one better we're less good at and there's, there's, that's part of the reboot I think we need to do in terms of the I'm just going to get, we're asking for concrete and practical examples. I'm going to give you a couple from the ICE space and I'm sure others around the table will share theirs. But uh, in relation to one of our biggest challenges, which is decarbonisation of concrete as a material, um, great work done by the um, Green Construction Board under the CLC, now moving into the IC, we've set up a task force to deliver, uh, to own the delivery on behalf of the industry of net zero concrete and that's a that's a long-term investment pro, uh, program which is going to involve investment from EPSRC, UKRI, it's going to require supply chain to change its behaviour, standard setters to get on board and go how do we prove that this stuff works in long term and all, all of that sort of stuff. So the IC is in a position to do something like that and has agreed to do so. The, the IC is also hosting um, TIP um, uh, labs and uh, what's it called? It tip live, tip live event. So where you take the transforming infrastructure performance information and you share it with communities of 200 where they get to do this sort of stuff over an entire day, share their experiences and, and essentially accelerate the sharing of experience so that you can learn and move forward in that regard. And so I think it's really important that if you, that those those three letter acronym organisations and there's a few four-letter acronym, I don't mean to dis diminish ties, but um, that we coordinate activity, play to mutual, uh, to respective strengths, uh, and, and we will uh, accelerate the transformation we're talking about here. So that's my two points. Just picking up on that, and it's uh, I smile, because uh, it wasn't me who came up with the convenient uh, agenda, it was Andy Mitchell, so uh, I'm just keen to support that. We have a 2.1 billion, so 2.1 million uh, people industry. And if you add in all of the support industry, probably another 700,000, so 3 million. It's not bad as a, you know, it's not the largest, but it's still quite a large economy. If we can just pick on those things and say, and I'm now going to go to a sporting analogy, like Team GB, 
Team UK construction, we could be pretty potent mm. how we drive that through. So, you know, there's all different events. We all have different ways of doing things. The training programs, you have centres for excellence. We need to establish those centres for excellence, get them to work together and really drive that through, which is why the MTC and Warwick Manufacturing has been successful because it's a centre for excellence yeah. with investments. But that also means you've got to say no to some things. Uh, and I'll pick on a small thing, but it's a hobby horse at the moment. If I look another diversity strategy from a three-letter, three letter, four-letter acronym establishment, they're all saying the same things and they're all competing on the same stage. And actually, we should just have one. We could be far more efficient. Uh, Adam picked on it. If, you know, if different sectors did earthworks, did retaining walls, did this, we wouldn't have to do it four times. We wouldn't have to have four lots of engineers competing on different type of contract. We could actually say, this is how we're going to take things forward. Now, I'm not saying we do that everywhere, but let's pick the three or four big, big ticket items that are going to make a massive impact and just say, that's it. And, and if you only look at big programs, and I was in the States recently, and I drove for quite a while, I didn't see a different bridge. Mm. I didn't see, and they were all the same. Some are a bit small, a little bit low, but that's the thing. we're on a different route. So I'm not saying they got it right on everything, but they were all the same for mile after mile after mile. There was no, and I remember doing a pitch to, this is our highways, agency i think it was it was a long time ago and just saying that you've got four suppliers doing four different designs and we could save 20 million on that this is going back 20 years ago you know we just got to stop this and say no 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 if we're only going to transport every transport does this one thing and then you drive all of that through you do it through volume so the volume you're talking about is too small you know if it's not a billion then you kind of let it go on tactical list and you'll have long tactical lists. Pick your billion, two billion items and just get one organisation to drive it through and say, stop, stop reinventing the wheel. So you do need standardisation. You do need one <coughs> organisation to, de to deliver the concept, but you have to deliver it for a price point. So. And it's that, it's that targeting is key. Yeah. It's just so much going on. You've got to pick yeah. half a dozen biggies. And if I was to observe about the ties thing, I would, if you were going again, I would say, what are the challenges? I would go harder on what are the challenges? Mm -hmm. And I'd say, what are we doing more of? Because I'm very happy we're doing footbridges, but it's a tiny part mm -hmm. of the overall transport infrastructure yeah, challenge. You know, why wouldn't we go after something like, you know, rail track? Maybe you did, but, you know, maybe it's maintenance of rail track and ballast and all that sort of stuff, which you do loads of. Um, so that, that, that strategic targeting, I think, is critical. And actually, it's easy as well, because we know how much we do on these different things. We can sense the opportunities in them. I mean, well, I love that note to kind of end on, bringing my involvement here to a close. And what I would ask of you is to think about what are those strategic, what are those 1 billion, 2 billion strategic targets um, that we can collaborate together on. And come back to me, um, shouldn't take more than a couple of weeks I would have thought, um, but certainly after recess or during recess um, is absolutely fine with me to spend some time understanding how government can help you do this. I'm particularly interested to know what the, the green diesel or hydrogen might be. You know, collectively, those 2.1, possibly 3 million people um, involved with driving, non-road going transport, and indeed road going transport, making sure that we've got the um, electric generation and also connections where it needs to be. That would be something I can really get behind and support on. And, um, and also the nature diversity. Do we need to standardise hedgehog houses? Particular personal priority of mine at the moment, having four baby hedgehogs in the garden. Um, really understanding, I was joking about that, but really understanding where are the big opportunities to target, to standardise without stifling innovation. Because I am nervous about this standardisation that then conflicts with the need to research, demonstrate and, um, you know, keep pushing forward, driving down costs and uh, using science. 
to solve the grand challenges that we have in society across the UK, but right across the world. So that's, that's my homework for you. Are we all agreed? Is that, am I out of order asking for that? Is that a reasonable request? There seems to be a, a level of optimism and, and positivity to do this. And I very much look forward to coming back with you all to, to understand uh, what next. Thank you again, genuinely, for all that you've done. You clearly, as individual companies committed to this, being here today and all the work that you've done thus far. So thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Mm -hmm. And Minister, thank you very much for coming and for uh, taking the risk of get us being your first gig. I hope you felt it was worthwhile mm. and that we were, uh, we were uh, alert to your agenda. And I think you've made that agenda very clear. And uh, I think we'll... Well, you're, you're the client, so I think you can give people homework, and you should, so thank you for doing that. And we're going to have a coffee now, and if you want, we might have the chance to chat if you've got, yeah, if you've got a minute. But thank you again for your encouraging words, your support, and your challenge. Thank you. So we're going to have a 20-minute coffee break out there, and, uh, and then we'll come back in. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Neil.
Back. I don't know what you thought of uh, that panel. What did we think of the panel? <laughs> Phil, what did you think of the panel? Awful. Awesome. 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 Did you really think that? Uh, have you read Phil's article that we, as part of uh, Marion and Emma, do a brilliant job on trying to... So, poor old HS2, you are terrible at marketing. <laughs> that was harsh. That was harsh. But we, we are not bad at marketing here at Ty's Living Lab. We're good at marketing and Phil's got a very good article which has been published recently and thank you to those of you who've liked it and thank you for the community you know and and some of you are better at the old linkedin and liking and sharing than others some of you are very good at it i could mention chris fry i could mention others that we never hear anything from but i wouldn't be so rude as to do that uh thank you uh for anyway for for uh <coughs> not 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 tying your shoelaces and getting too bored during the panel. I saw Malcolm was looking at pictures of tractors on his phone, but he got away with it. <coughs> no, I, I, I hope you felt that was the right sort of debate. I and mean, it was good to, it was good to highlight to the minister the, the, the great work you've, you've done. And I think she, I think she agrees actually. I think she doesn't really understand yet why we are, we are the kind of the people that get it and it's the other people in the other rooms that don't get it so she's got a bit of uh, catching up and she's she liked the skills stuff she was good on that so i think you'll that's a good thing for you for you guys as well so I, I as you've noticed i'm not anthony i'm sorry i'm not anthony he's much better at being a, he's a professional chair right he's got covid you'll have noticed peter isn't here so we let's send our thoughts to peter i don't know if he's streaming live peter our thoughts are with you you've worked for four years on this and you're not here <laughs> What a shame. So we are here in spirit and because you're not here, we're massively over time and it's all a shambles, but don't worry, the qual quality is good. Anyway, let's get back on track. We've got uh, a really important uh, harmonization, picking up on those themes, Andy and Livia. Andy, as most of you will know, is an absolute, he's one of our kind of dirty dozen. Not that we have that in Living Lab, but if we had a dirty dozen, Andy would be one of them and has chaired the, the standard steering group through thick and thin, yes. hasn't it? So Andy, over to you and to Livia. Thank you very much. Right, so good, good uh, morning all. So as uh, Neil has introduced me, I work for TfL. I sit in a team called Engineering Delivery Optimization, so I've got a remit really across the piece, but one of the roles I've picked up with that is a harmonization of standards, and in particular, um, the chairmanship of the TIES uh, Standard Steering Group, so working on that group with Network Rail and RSSB and highways. So why harmonize standards? Well, we've heard earlier on this morning about the TIP roadmap and the construction playbook. Um, and the Living Lab operating model also calls upon uh, relevant standards to be harmonised because actually if we want to, to adopt some of these innovations collectively, one of the key enablers is to align our requirements. So we're actually all asking for the same thing. So there's a key distinction here between standards and standardisation. So the standards are the guardrails that stop us falling off the edge of the cliff. They define the design envelope that we have to design solutions to fit within. We can deviate from those standards. We can do a risk assessment which allows us to go beyond with certain controls, or we can even agree to change those limits if we think it's sensible. But the point is standards as a whole allow us to have a wide range of permissible solutions. So we get the economies of scale by removing unnecessary differences between those standards but then at the same time by creating an environment where standardization and continuous improvement can prosper so that's the point you know i think Trudy was uh, the minister was picking up about uh, not wanting to stifle innovation so we encourage the standardization where it makes sense but we also allow within the standards for people to come up with disruptive solutions that achieve the same thing quite differently and i think it's true that 
different organisations have reached different judgments as to what's acceptable and permissible for the same situation. So we'll hear from Livia um, shortly about some of the, the examples with footbridges. And sometimes there's reasons for that in terms of the different environment. There are, there are fundamental differences between a railway with overhead electrification and a bridge over a motorway, for example. Um, but at the same time, there are also similarities. And where we do have the same situation, we ought to be getting to a consistent answer. So by having harmonisation, by having uh, alignment of our requirements, we can then incentivise common components, common products, um, and facilitate approaches such as modern methods of construction. Aligned with that, and also within that wider framework of aligning standards, we're also doing work around trying to facilitate the sharing of reference designs. Uh, and this, again, was alluded to earlier. If we can come up with designs which are good for a particular purpose, then why wouldn't we make those accessible to other organisations so we can share them and apply continuous improvement to them? So part of the challenge there is rather than having a, a repository of 10,000 random CAD files, creating a structure around it so we can actually organise that information and make it easy to, for people to search. Um, and even small increases in harmonisation and standardisation will give benefits of quite large numbers. You see a figure there of £650 billion for the investment pipeline for infrastructure. You know, even 1% of that would be nice, and hopefully we can do rather better than that. And as mentioned, it's a key policy of um, construction playbook and the tip roadmap. So examples from other industries. An example you'll, you will all be familiar with is the USB connector. If you remember life before USB connectors, you used to have to install driver software for whatever device you were plugging into your computer. You used to have to think about you know, what manufacturer you were buying it from and was it compatible with your operating system. Now, with a USB, you can be almost 100% confident that when you plug that device into your computer, it's going to work. You don't actually think about whether you've heard of that supplier, whether it's the same supplier as you made your laptop. Uh, kitchen design is another example where clearly in our houses all our physical kitchens are different shapes but the kitchen design industry has standardized to the point of using modular components so they've standardized around 60 centimeter wide units 60 centimeter wide 60 centimeter wide appliances so that when you go and look for a new appliance for a built-in kitchen you're not going out with the tape measures to think is it going to fit or not that in turn facilitates choice, it facilitates growth of industry, it facilitates innovation within those constraints of those defined interfaces. Automotive, one, one of my colleagues used to work for a major car manufacturer and they actually had a target of reusing 60% of their design when they produce a new model. Now clearly when you get to the high end of the market that, that target is going to be a lot lower but for the mass market cars that's how you get the cost down, is by reducing the amount of reinventing the wheel, literally, when you're producing a new model. So by adopting that target, they were able to bring the lead time for a new model from four years down to two years. So implied in that is a, a significant saving in resource, but also a competitive advantage for the company in terms of bringing new models to market more quickly. Another example which uh, Tim uh, Limburger in the room has been involved in is the AIMCH initiative in the housing industry where three different house builders have got together to look at how they can standardise components for housing. And what they identified as one example was that they found they had slightly different floor to ceiling heights in their houses of about 25 millimetres difference between the three of them. And the consequence was that they couldn't use the same staircase product. So I don't think the staircase manufacturer necessarily had a problem with that because they had small quantities of lots of different products and they were getting paid the market rate for those products. But by standardising that height, then the, standard, then the staircase manufacturers are now able to produce a common product that they can sell everywhere. So again, that's an example of how you can align the standards to remove um, barriers to standardisation. So if you can harmonise standards in combination with areas where you've got the procurement volume, then you're going to get the economies of scale. So here are just a few of the benefits of standard harmonisation. Economies of scale have mentioned, we've heard about avoiding reinventing the wheel, enabling collective procurement, and that can be collective procurement across projects within an organisation, 
in, in TfL, for example, we typically would buy one footbridge at a time for one project at a time. And so we don't have that sort of collective organisation to be able to say, over the five years, we know we're going to be able to build you know, five footbridges or whatever the number is, so we're going to purchase them all as an entity. And then if you extrapolate that across the ties partners, you can then see your way to even greater economies of scale. We heard about lessons learned earlier, and again, going back to automotive, when you talk to people who work in automotive and those companies that do this really well, they have a much stronger culture of people working to process. And so when they get to the end of a project and they do their lessons learned, what they do is to systematically update their process, update their training and briefing material to embed those lessons. Whereas what we typically do is to capture the lessons in the big database and then require people to look at that database for the next project. And the result is that it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. People may or may not find the lessons that are relevant. So individuals, in my experience, do tend to learn the lessons. Organisations are much less good at learning those lessons corporately. So if we can take not all of the lessons, but the top 20% of the lessons are actually going to drive the most value and embed those in a harmonised standard, not only are we starting to transfer the knowledge, but we're also getting the benefit across the, the, the partners rather than just doing it for one organisation. So there's lots of examples like that of where having a harmonised standard makes it easier to get continuous improvement. You can get more transferable skills because the supplier and, and personnel designer skills will be more familiar with the standards we're working to because they're used to working to the same documents and therefore you get fewer mistakes. You can get repeatable site methods, reduce maintenance costs, consistent components, etc., and improved understanding. So all of these things, you can create a sort of virtuous circle where you have that procurement volume. So we've looked at an area where we think we can really try and pilot an approach to harmonising standards. And we've picked Footbridges partly because it's a Living Lab demonstrator project. And so this is very much a parallel work to the, the demonstrator project, um, but also because it's an asset of, of common interest. And also we hope from our initial uh, view that we wouldn't expect there to be massive amounts of difference in the fundamentals of a footbridge. The laws of physics are the same, human economics are the same. So why should it be different? But the reality is we do have different documents which say the same thing in, in different ways. So. Network Rail uh, engaged WSP on our behalf to do a bit of work to uh, really look at all of our different standards from our different partner organisations and identify what are the commonalities and differences. Um, and they came up with a colour coding system, which I'll we'll, we'll take you into a bit more in a minute, um, and they've done that analysis. We are now doing a piece of work to actually develop that uh, proof of concept standard in what's shown up there as stage two. Uh, to really work through what are the, the, the practical implications of trying to align our, our requirements. Once we've done that, we've, we'll have a piece of consultation to do with people in this room, with wider supply chain, with our governance panels that currently endorse standards, really to get endorsement to that as a proof of concept to say, does this work as a, as a concept, as a process? Do we see a way to be able to, being able to manage it and apply changes to it and apply continuous improvement to it? How do we actually use this as a, as a sort of product development type process to knock the, you know, knock the wrinkles out of the process to actually figure out how we do this so we can then scale it up for other areas? That's essentially where we're at. So governance and publication, we, we're having conversations about. We've got some options. We're working through that with um, our colleagues at RSSB. And I should say here that you know RSSB is the Rail Safety and Standards Board. They already have some expertise around harmonising standards for the rail industry, for the national rail parties. Um, they don't currently deal with highways, but you know, they at least do have that expertise about how you manage standards across lots of different client bodies. And so we're working with RSSB to develop those governance options and to to actually come up with a plan to, to complete the standard, the consultation, the publication. And then once we've done that, we'll be into maintenance. So fundamental to all of this, though, is 
the organisational commitment that in determining what's our scale of ambition for harmonisation of standards, that needs to come with a commitment of resource from the different organisations. You know, we, we, we've been working on this footbridge standard very much as a um, sort of best endeavours type activity to, to, to take it forward, to actually develop the principles in order to prove the concept. And we have to prove that concept in order to evidence the business case to justify the resources to do, to do more. But that, that's kind of where we're at at the minute. But the hope is coming out of today that we'll you know, light some interest among the parties to say, well, yes, this is obviously a good thing to do. Let's commit some to having a target by the end of the financial year uh, of how much we're actually going to do for the next five years. So, uh, Olivia, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, just before you hand over, take any comments or questions? Uh, I was going to suggest I'll, I'll come back and we'll take Chris, Chris to the end, if that's right. Olivia? taking my time because I think it's just noon now. It just hits 12 o'clock. So good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Livia Garcia, Principal Civil Engineer with RSSB, Rail Safety and Standards Board. Producing harmonised standards for the national rail industry is what we do. This time round, the extra element is to bring in all of the Thai's partners. We agreed at the outset that the output of this stage should be a proof of concept standard, and that is a document whose, whose um, technical content has been endorsed, but which is not yet formally mandated through the appropriate change panels. This will give us the opportunity to engage widely with key stakeholders within the ties partners and their supply chains to get feedback on the document prior to publication. So the starting point was to assemble a working group with representation from across the ties partners to produce a first draft of the standard using the structure de developed by WSP. The first draft will be a proof of concept document, which will be used as a mechanism to agree the harmonized technical content. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, everyone in the working group for their contribution to date. As mentioned by uh, Andy earlier on, WSP did the initial work to compare and contrast the requirements from the various input standards. WSP developed a system of color coding. So these are the numbers of statements or clauses from existing standards. Green requirements are those which are essentially the same across different organizations. Blues are statements which could, in principle, apply to all partners. The red are the statements that are only applicable to one partner. And the yellow are statements with technical differences. So as you can see, the um, actual technical differences, clauses with te technical differences are actually very few. So in terms of developing the standard, we have taken the structure proposed by WSP and used the requirements set as a basis for development of the proof of concept standard that I've mentioned earlier on. The working group has been meeting weekly since February, and I am pleased to report that the experience to date has been extremely positive. We've had consistent representation from RSSB, Network Rail, National Highways and TFL. 
Many in the group are working on this alongside their busy day jobs and have come to the group with a collaborative mindset to develop wordings that can work for all partners. We've also established a peer review group comprising the respective technical heads, which meets on a less regular basis to review what we've done, any points of principle, and to provide direction on areas with difference. So what's the progress of the work then? I am pleased to um, report that the first proof of concept draft standard is around 50% complete at this stage. So here are some examples of, um, of the harmonization opportunities that we have identified so far within the working group. We have agreed on some common definitions and terms. For example, we have agreed on what are actually requirements versus guidance. Maybe some examples, more specific examples can be added into guidance instead of uh, adopting them as requirements. We have identified that slip resistance in surfacing, for example, is an area where harmonization could be achieved. At the moment, different levels of resistance are adopted by different partners, but we have agreed in principle to standardize this area. The working group has also identified that footbridge heights, especially over the railways, where there are overhead lines, can really benefit from having more guidance and standardization. And also, we have had some fruitful discussions around the provision of lifts or ramps for accessibility. And we have arrived at more consistency thinking across partners in this area. So um, what are some indirect benefits that could stem out from this harmonization exercise? We believe that there is huge potential to enable common procurement specification for collective procurement. We have already started the process of generating collaborative positive discussions that encourage challenge to existing provisions through the working group and through the peer review group meetings. The work could help to build relationships and to encourage best practice sharing within the transport industry. And furthermore, the key objective to achieve consistent application of the standard across partners could be materialized. So by agreeing common requirements for identical scenarios, we don't necessarily make a significant cost saving for one single footbridge or, or structure, but we do expect to unlock economies of scale for multiple footbridges by having common requirements and reducing, reinventing the wheel, the term that we have heard many, many times today. Thank you, so back to you. Thanks, Thanks Livia. So, um, what next? Well, first of all, we obviously have to complete our work to conclude the first draft of the proof of concept standard. Um, I'm pleased to say that you know, all, all parties involved are, are sort of fully committed to doing that. We all see the value of doing it. I would really echo Livia's um, comment that you know, everyone in that group has come to the group with the right mindset and with integrity. People have obviously got different um, reasons why their organisations have got different requirements. But um, by you know, unpicking the reasons why, for example, network rail footbridges normally have lifts for accessibility and highway footbridges almost never do, they always have ramps, unpicking that to figure out well, what's right for a different scena each scenario and trying to come up with consistent wording that works for everyone. Because it's not right to have a, a lift in a, for, a, for a footbridge over a railway between two fields on a public footpath that isn't accessible. It, that would clearly be nonsense. You've also got the overhead of people potentially being stuck in the lift for a period of time and taking a long time to get uh, freed. And you've got the maintenance costs as well. So it's about understanding what's right for different situations and actually having that clarity of 
guidance so you're not having that conversation on every single project and Livia mentioned the point about the, the footbridge heights you'd think you know building a footbridge over an overhead line electrified railway would be a common thing to do and it is but there isn't a standard height for a footbridge over an overhead line electrified railway in the network rail standards currently so so part of this is about identifying having harmonized identifying where do we think are the opportunities to go a little bit further and actually lay down some ground rules where they don't currently exist so um complete the footbridge standard undertake some formal design reviews with, with a wider stakeholder group bringing in supply chain representatives and maintainers etc and doing some industry consultation consulting all of the governance panels and just within tfl we have got governance panels galore we've got one for london underground we've got dlr we've got trams we've got overground each of our modes have got its own governance panel at the moment and that's something we're working on internally to try and harmonize so we can at least have a a one-stop panel that is capable of endorsing pan tfl changes um, and that's just a microcosm of the uk's transport industry as a whole so when you take that up a level and look at you know, the whole all, of all the clients in that what rail have got their, their standards groups rssb have got theirs highways have got theirs so it's about trying to herd all the cats if you like to actually get them on board with what we're trying to achieve here and find the most effective way through which is why the governance is taking a little bit of time to actually nail down but it's really important to get it right because it's fundamental to making this work um, hosting the, the standard for the for the purpose of the single footbridge standard rssb are in the lead lead for developing it so rssb will be the owner of that document um, we will you know, use this as i say as a proof of concept we are you know looking at what the right answer is in terms of if we if we were able to be successful in scaling this up what we don't want to do is set up an, another clone of rssb as an, another standards organization as another you know government owned standards body so it's about trying to make it work most effectively with the organizations we've got um, but we do need that process for ongoing management in terms of how do you manage departures for example it, it makes sense that we are all accountable for our own safety management system so each organization has got to be able to decide to deviate from the standard where it's applicable but at the same time you also want those deviations to get reported back to the, the central standard owner so you understand what are the recurring themes that everyone's finding with that standard and we don't have a situation where everyone's quietly ignoring it and doing their own thing so you need that sort of continuous improvement cycle feedback loop going on and, and then monitoring period once we published including some form of post implementation review is what we're envisaging so thinking about the benefits um, as, as Livy mentioned I think what we're recognizing is we haven't really had those eureka moments in developing the footbridge standard where we say oh we didn't realize you could do it like that we can save so much money by by changing the way we design footbridges we haven't really had that to be honest but at the same time by taking some light slip resistance and saying well actually if we all had the same slip resistance it would then encourage suppliers to offer the same product um, we then get the economies of scale the actual choice of slip resistant it, it does influence what surfaces you use for your flooring it doesn't necessarily make a big difference to the cost of a single footbridge so it's about aligning the requirements you can get the economies of scale you then get your design cost down you get production cost down um, and having got that consistency of approach it then creates the environment as mentioned before where you can create those reference designs you can create a repository of, of boilerplate requirements for our technical specifications where we can effectively all look on a, a common system and look at what others are, are specifying and you know take those vanilla requirements and then tweak them tailor them for our own purposes and also it means that suppliers when they're receiving those specifications are receiving a common look and feel for those specifications so they're used to you know receiving that specification that they know where to look for the you know the, the specific elements like the dimensions or the things that would be specific to the location so by getting greater consistency you can then um, get better at benchmarking it's quite difficult at the moment to really as ben has found out to, to actually benchmark the costs of footbridges because you're not necessarily comparing apples and oranges uh, or apples and apples even um, you know you, you get prices from local authorities and some of those bridges are, are, are bridges over streams for example about 10 foot long and we're trying to compare that cost of one of those with a, a sort of 
bridge over a four-lane or four-lane highway. You know, it's, it, 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 it is important that we get that taxonomy clear, that classification clear, so we are clearly understanding what we're comparing and what's included in the cost and what isn't. So things like, you know, does it include the lighting cost? Does it include um, you know, provision of lifts? All those factors clearly have a big bearing of cost. It's really important in, in classifying that we were able to compare. Um, now, the footbridge pipeline estimated in the work Ben's done is 135 bridges over five years. Now, at approximately you know, two or three million pounds for a bridge over a railway, you know, that's clearly a substantial sum of money. So in that context, you know, we don't think it's unreasonable that we should be expecting savings of you know, 10 million pounds and, and probably a lot more than that from this work. It's quite difficult to nail down a precise number because of the variability of the pipeline. But at the same time, understanding the size of the prize is actually fundamental to justifying why we should be putting more effort into harmonisation of standards. And again, it comes back to the point made earlier about picking those relatively small number of key um, areas for harmonisation, doing those first and then really working forward on an, an 80-20 basis of where is it that this approach would make sense. So we thought of a few other areas where standardisation should bring benefits. Equipment rooms being an obvious one, being one of the other demonstrators. Uh, you know, the product that has been developed for the Living Lab has been developed for TfL. There has been an initial piece of work done to identify what the differences in standards are between ourselves and Network Rail and the others. Um, so in principle, we could do the same piece of work on equipment room standards for harmonisation. Um, that, that's a piece of work that we're not currently resourced to do, but absolutely would make sense to do going forward. Um, other areas we've identified re retaining walls, areas of common interest, we all have them. Uh, earthworks, hazardous materials, um, but yeah, very well, welcome to receive um, any other suggested and for areas where we think standardisation would give benefits. And I think a really important point to stress here is it's about pitching it at the right level. You, know, you de don't generally want to go down to product level, but it's about somewhere in the, the middle around how you to bring different products together and assemble them in a particular way that makes sense that you can reuse that, that building block of design. It's all about building blocks of design here and, and figuring out what, you, what is that entity that makes sense to have some harmonisation around. So some key messages. We've developed a methodology for harmonising our requirements. We're developing the governance arrangements to make it work. We do need commitment of additional resource to actually up the pace of the harmonisation. But if we do that, we can unlock significant collective benefit. The size of that benefit depends on the size of the work pipeline, clearly, but it also potentially can be um, expanded if we can really crack collective procurement and actually find ways of saying for yeah. the ties partners as a whole, we know we need 100 foot bridges, so why wouldn't we set up that production line of 100 foot bridges and Yes, we can, once you've got a production line going, you can flex it up and down according to the rate. But the challenge is actually getting that production line going in the first place and actually getting that commitment to see that the demand is there for it. Um, further details and information paper, don't think it's out yet, but it will be out definitely this week is what we're expecting. Um, and the key recommendation that by the end of the year that we should strive to achieve a target for the next five years for what, what our ambition is for standards harmonisation. Right. And just before I close, I'd like to acknowledge all of the people who have contributed to this. Many people, as Liv has mentioned, have worked on this alongside their, their busy day jobs. This hasn't been a sort of formal part of their, their role to do, so it's really encouraging that we've seen that continued commitment to the standards group and to the footbridge group, which means that you know, everyone that's actually seen the value in this and seeing that, that it's a good thing to do. Um, so two working groups. Uh, RSSB for, for agreeing to sort of lead the development on this and to, to really be a strong partner in developing the governance arrangements. And then there's a key infrastructure clients, Network Rail, uh, Transport for London and National Highways. Right, on that note, any questions? Please come and have a seat, Livia and Andy. First of all, thank you so much. The tenacity we like tenacity, 
it's what wins. And your tenacity to get that to where it is is fabulous. Uh, so many points to bring out there. I love, did you like that? Harmonization of harmonization, the different panels. I mean, that's brilliant, right? That shows you the, the, the size of the problem. I remember when we did the benchmarking for other sectors, I think you're underestimating your, your, your benefits. And it's always better to be too low because DFT will kill us if we say something too much. But the other sectors, the water sector, have standardised pumps and saved a fortune because the OPEX of these assets is far more than the CAPEX. So that requires a whole life cost. So I'd like to bring in Malcolm or Doug on the whole life costing point. Just any comments from you on that? You know, is that, I know that's not been what you've been focusing on, but there's a whole life, there's a whole life thing here where we can really, we could really add value to this. Thank you for the warning, Neil. I'm yeah. Right <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that. Well, I could talk for a long time, but I won't, I promise you. Um, yeah, the, the, the issue with whole life costing is that, that I think everybody recognises that finding the best whole life value, which I would rather talk about than whole life cost, yeah. um, may require, not always, but may require an upfront investment. And so there is always a tension between affordability and optimum solution. And, and that is the conundrum that has to be resolved. And I would always rather go for long-term benefits and value than I would for today's affordability, but I recognise very much the constraints that everybody's working under. Yeah, brilliant comment. I'm going to bring Guy now in the tradition of not not uh, not giving people any warning. Guy, you measure, you know, in, in in some of your customers have got many different kinds of points, haven't they? Uh, and you know, you're someone who deals with, and understands these opex costs. Have you got any comments on? You might not be up to date with the opex of footbridges. We don't expect you to be. I never, I never knew how excited I would get about footbridges before I joined Living Lab. But can you give us an analogue, something you've, you've, some of the work you've been doing in other areas? Um, I, firstly, I'd say that I used to build a lot of bridges in, earlier in life, so I'm quite excited about bridges. Um, you blew, you blew them up as well, bridges. didn't you, though? Yeah, <laughs> no, great fun. Um, uh, I think the, the issue that, uh, around this standardisation and... I'd sort of push it towards simplification as well of of, uh, uh, of all the components we have within the railway is is a much bigger problem than than uh, I think is first felt. Uh, just in the maintenance of our S and T kit at the moment, we have to uh, we've developed you know um, in excess of three three hundred individual competencies that people need to hold to maintain all the different bits of kit. That's just what one person could possibly hold. Obviously, they can't hold all of those in practical terms. But and that adds up in, uh, across thousands and thousands of people across, uh, you, know, um, you know, miles and miles of track. So it, it's a cumulative problem that uh, I think contributes to uh, ever greater complexity around running a sort of a safe railway every single day. And uh, f from what I can observe, that directional arrow is still getting more complex every single day as new kit gets put on and older kit um, still stays in there and we have to maintain it. And by the time we come into the digitization stuff, it's getting even more complicated. So I think we have to find a way um, to move, to simplify uh, and standardize the railway in a way that um, the people dimension on this that we often forget um, is easier to manage. Brilliant, thank you. So we're going to. So Malcolm is saying that there's a job to be done to educate people that the cost of standardisation or simplification is important. That's why we're here. Whole life value, guys, reinforcing that uh, and 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 in, in fact adding to it. In, in water, they went from 16 different types of pumps to three. And they saved a lot of OPEX in terms of training, and you mentioned transferable skills, but also they fixed it first time because they knew the thing inside out. So an accountant said, let's rip out all those pumps and put in three. The engineers went nuts, right? But that's the bravery that we need. And uh, there was a very good question that Emma's going to help me with because yeah, I don't have your biometrics, but Ed was going to come in while we get the question back. Ed. 
Yeah, thank you. I want to say a fantastic piece of work. A, a couple of sort of observations uh, uh, and a question or two. But um, what, what, one of the things, uh, and that last part picked it up, so I, I, I completely get the idea of standards and, and getting the standards harmonised. That's very helpful. But uh, there's also a process of optimising the standards within those boundaries to make sure it, they are actually controlling what you want to control. And you didn't mention in, in your presentation anything about carbon. Uh, and clearly we're interested in carbon today and I'd be interested to know what, if anything, has gone into these standards as a result of that. Uh, the second point was that um, we, we, we're part of the consortium doing the AVA footbridge and I've done uh, several of these over the years as well. And, and some of the things that um, you were saying, I was that there was the things that weren't on the screen. So we know that the key determinant of cost is actually possessions and the faff of getting the thing built and a very prolonged front and getting approvals. And so it's all very well talking about whether we're using this out of the other material or whether we're painting we're not painting all the rest of it I wondered whether there, there was thought in that sort of process of not only harmonizing but maybe even optimizing standards to address those sorts of issues picking up the point that was just made around whole life is what do the standards say about that because we know repainting footbridges is, is safety problematic all sorts of issues that flow from that so so I think the two, two points there is within the sort of standards thing what are you choosing to optimize and focus around uh, and and has that been the remit of your group and then a couple of other things that wait Ed, no, that's, listen that's too difficult so let's pause Got, there okay, okay. Yeah. and because <laughs> there's two questions already so are you are you okay to take those yeah. Andy and Olivia yeah absolutely I think, uh, first of all, our objective has been to harmonise what we've currently got and just to align what's currently out there. So we have one single document that we agree represents the as-is situation. Before we go to publication, we are looking to take that to a design review process to say, you know, what are the immediate opportunities that we ought to be looking to incorporate in the standard before we before we publish and one of those for example we've already had the challenge from you know, profession heads to actually really come up with the answers about um, footbridge height for example which to a lay person should be absolutely standard there's no reason for it not to be standard but it isn't standard <laughs> so there's some obvious things that we should tackle um, before we before we publish there will be other things um, which will be subject to continuous improvement and and i think you know sustainability and carbon absolutely in the forefront now it wasn't when most of these standards were written and so i think there's a you know a, 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 there's, it's a completely valid question it's kind of on in on the on the on the um, you know on the list of things to try and figure out what we want to say about it so um, let's pause there and then we're going to come on to the possession point then ed's going to come back and i've got another question now i want everyone to know if those of you that were awake for the panel will remember the minister pressing the, the people on the panel on carbon mm. and the people on the panel talking about embankments and uh, aggregates and concrete and stuff like that. Now, Andy gave us those slides before the panel, so you were completely in tune with mm. that debate. And I suspect you're going to be pressed on those other mm. subjects. Yeah. Now, Ed was asking also about possession time. Yeah, well, I think... Is that something you've touched on, not really? It, it, isn't, it isn't something we've touched on in the standards, but, you know, in the same way that we've talked about reference designs and boilerplate requirements, there's an awful lot of different areas where, having harmonised the standards, we can then look and branch out and say, well, where are the areas that we're different that we can actually build on the, the aligned standards to, to harmonise? But the thing is, when, when you start looking at possession arrangements, you are talking about fundamentally different um, you know, approaches to safety. I mean, on, on the underground, for example, we allow people on the track when the, when the power's off on the conductor rail, as, as one of the means in which we satisfy ourselves that there aren't going to be any trains coming. You do that on network rail, you're probably going to get hit by a diesel train. <laughs> you know, it's, there are some fundamental differences in the culture of the way the safety systems are set up, which are not but going to be straightforward. It's a big factor, Ed, and I know why you're asking it. Ali's here, he's somebody who thinks about time. Some of the footbridge benefits of the, the off-site dimension mm -hmm. meant that uh, we did save a lot of time, yeah. and we need to get better at valuing that time. I Livia, think, and so then uh, then Andy back. Livia, mm -hmm. Andy, and then back to Ed, and then Caroline. Livia. Yes, um, just the point about sustainability. 
I think like many things, we have to find the balance. For example, when we were discussing about, say, um, the minimum dimensions for footbridges, we did think about uh, um, sustainability. For example, it's easy to just adopt the more, you know, the most onerous number, for example. But then there were times when we actually question, uh, say, one organization is adopting two meters, or another organization comes up with 1.5. Why the difference? And I think the most important point to bear in mind is um, the standard isn't, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's not just about one footbridge. We are affecting many, many footbridges that would follow this guidance. So, um, yeah, that's, that's something we have you know, thought about when we were developing the draft document to date. Thank you, Olivia. Andy, and then yeah, back to I, I was just building on the point about the possessions. One area we have been working on in TfL is really to think a lot more about implementation strategy as part of our option selection stage. By implementation strategy, it's you know, multifaceted. It's it's the migration stages of what stages are you going to go through to deliver whatever asset it is. But it's also, are you going to do off-site construction or on-site construction? How are you actually going to put the asset in service? Are you going to you know, deliver it in you know, engineering hours? Or are you going to have a closure, etc.? All those sort of factors around how you implement the works are fundamental to, to risk, they're fundamental to uh, operational disruption, fundamental to cost and schedule. And by understanding those sub-options, once you've decided what the, what the sort of outcomes of the project are, are going to be, understanding those sub-options, you can actually sort of really achieve some benefits. Because sometimes we jump into a in, into contract, having decided what it, what it is we want to specify without having really thought through those implementation options. Thank you, Andy. Ed, you're one, one time back. <laughs> Just talking, it'll come on. It, it's magic. Wonderful, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah, so, so um, I realise it's a slightly unfair question because I know you're, you're really harmonising existing standards. Um, I think that the, you made the point about putting the right sort of, we didn't you put it like this, but the right lens on the microscope, you know, not too, not too big systemically, but not right, right, super granularly. You've got, got to frame the question at the right level. I think you're, you're making another point now, which is you've got to go end to end on the process and understand where the issues are. Yeah. And standards can control different parts of that end to end process. Yeah. Uh, and so as you optimise the standards, I think it would be really useful if you were to look end to end on the process yes. and, and find those things. Not everything's controlled by standards, but some of them are. And then my final sort of throwaway on this is I, in your list, you had this sort of um, the footbridge group. I don't know what that is, but with the exception of that, I looked at the rest and I said, where are the experienced footbridge designers on that list? And are you sure that you've captured the things that really frustrate the designers? Because I can tell you personally, from our experience, some of the things that weren't on the list that you chose to select were about the design of the balustrade and whether you can put your hand through it, you can't put it through, what size of openings you've got, the whole issue of the balustrade and the illumination of faces. and. Uh, these, these sorts of things are intensely time consuming mm. when you're going back and forwards with uh, standards authorities to mm. resolve and they weren't on the list and I just mm. wondered mm. whether you had people who experienced the, uh, the application of standards from mm. a sort of designer and constructor okay, perspective. So two questions there, thanks. Um, I'll shut up now. The, um, <laughs> the end to end process yeah. and then the, the expertise, to what extent did you need that? So, well, I think end-to-end -end process the answer is absolutely yes we need to understand how the standard will actually um, be applied and what opportunities can it create for you know, spin-off bits of work but I think perhaps Livia because you come from a structural engineering background you can talk about the expertise side of things. Yes I think uh, that's a very good point um, I think that's where um, the consultation comes into play and I myself have a bit of experience in looking at putting footbridges into, um, say, for example, existing, some busy existing um, stations. Um, and yeah, also reviewed many designs done by other, other consultants. Um, in terms of myself, I've done like early, early design where standard like this would really, really help because I can't emphasize how many times the same questions kept coming up when I looked at, okay, putting a footbridge there, okay, at a um, busy station, what are the dimensions? Whether we are, okay, for, st for stations, it's easy because um, most of the time we're looking at 
you know, putting uh, lifts in. But what about remote areas where you're closing level crossings and replacing with a footbridge? Do you put a lift in there? So I have to say, like, f from time and time again, the same questions kept coming up. And I have to say, this is just me, my own experience. But uh, in terms of the wider, you know, like knowledge uh, contribution, I think that's where the uh, consultation really would come into play. Yeah, I think Thank you, Olivia. No, we'll need to move. Gillian's here from DFT, There's, and she's designing the, the capabilities of the future. I mean, the understanding all of this stuff is absolutely central, isn't it, to the whole value for money proposition. So uh, you don't need to know about footbridges, Gillian. Don't worry, we're not going to test you on footbridges. It's knowing about the contribution of harmonisation to productivity is the capability that we need. Uh, there's a question from Caroline. Caroline, I think it's Caroline Botwood, who is David's boss. So we better take that question. Very good question, as you'd expect from Caroline. She's saying, OK, there's a number up there. Was it 10 million? Yeah. What does it cost? And this is Malcolm's point. There will be a cost to this. Yeah. What does it cost to get 10 million? Roughly, we're, we're talking about of the order of £100,000 worth of time to actually develop the standard in terms of the actual first draft of the proof of concept, it's somewhere in that order, um, and, and allowing for a you know, degree of iterations. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, not an, it's not an insignificant volume of effort. I mean, we've had a working group meeting weekly since February on this, and people have been doing work off, offline as well, and then we're, we're halfway through the first draft, so you add up all that time, it does add up, but, uh, you know, £100,000 to get 10 million is still a pretty good rate of return. Right. Decent ROI. You can take that to any of your mm. panels, and I know you've got a lot of them. David and then Gerard. Sorry, David. Nick, then Gerard. Olivia, Andy, great work on this and to your team. It's been brilliant. So I'm just picking up on what the Minister said, said earlier about stifling innovation. So I can absolutely see the benefit of harmonisation of standards. Absolutely. In my experience, we do lose a lot of opportunity in our ARBs and our organisations in people either encourage not to challenge standards or the process to challenge standard is is incredibly hard so there's a whole behavior and culture element to really bring out not just the value of following harmonized standards but also identify innovation opportunity have how has have you in the working group thought about that people and that culture and that behavior side or is that part of the legacy we're leaving behind but great work thanks great question Nick. Thank you. yeah so that would definitely be part of the consultation that we we go out with once we've got a, a complete draft is to invite the challenges of you know, where do the current standards fall down so we pick those relatively low hanging fruit like, like footbridge heights and try and address them and potentially do something carbon as well um, but I think the one of the you know, retrospective experiences of standards is a lot of work goes into them but then they tend to stand still for an awful long time and they get out of date yeah. So That's what, what you had in mind, isn't yeah. it, Nick? They become set in yeah. stone, like so, so, the Ten Commandments. So the objective is to make this an outcome-based standard and really then create the environment of reference designs, boilerplate requirements, where people can innovate and apply continuous improvement in a far more dynamic way than you can do with standards. And that's the hard bit. Yeah. OK, great point, great legacy point, though. Gerard. Thank you. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, good work, Andy. Good work, Olivia. A um, couple of little observations, really. Was one. I think you're. I think you could probably unlock more savings. Um, you know, we're we're involved in procurement, one of our businesses, and uh, in general construction, early contractor involvement, which is uh, a really important point at the moment because it helps you deal with a lot of the pressures of inflation, uh, um, and looking at program, not project, which is what the construction playbook talks about. So, 135 foot bridges, five years, about 400 million. I think you could, if you put some efforts around early contractor involvement, you could probably protect yourself against inflation because you're going to see a lot of that and, and get some more savings. So I think that would be a really good piece of work for you, number one. Number two, there's a lot of talk about productivity at the moment. You know, we're hearing a lot of stuff about productivity and it's widely acknowledged that um, the construction industry is not as uh, tech savvy as it, as it possibly should be in, in other industries like manufacturing and others. Now, have you put any thought at all uh, when you're looking at standards into standard processes, standard uses of software, standard forms of contract, and all of those elements, which uh, um, there's been a lot of talk about design and products, which I get, 
but you know there's an awful lot of soft savings which which you might you know you might not realize the value of those but uh, which are from that so i was just going to ask you that point yeah so i fully agree again it's i suppose one one step at a time first step is actually to get that as is crystallized of where we're currently at and have one version of it but then absolutely to then try and throw rocks at it and construct a way to say where how can we improve it and where are the obvious opportunities but then from there as you say the next steps are then to say well what are what the building blocks we put in place and a bunch of reference designs and also creating a, a framework for, for template requirements which then you know, leads towards having um, consistent procurement specifications where we would have vanilla uh, blocks of requirements for different yeah. aspects for different parts of the designs so that you can you know, create consistent uh, procurement specifications um, from whichever client it happens to come from. Thank you. Great. And Uchenna's here. He's our cyber expert. So wave, Uchenna. Anybody wants to talk about cyber, talk to Uchenna. But Uchenna will have a view on, on standardization of software as well from a cyber security point of view. But we won't get into that just now because I think people are almost had enough on footbridges before lunch. But there's time for just one more bite at this. Sam. Yeah. Um We've obviously talked only about uh, footbridges uh, applicable to our little island or little Britain, um, but the whole world needs footbridges. And there's, there's got to be some opportunities in relation to, to this work uh, more internationally. Uh, have you given any thought to that? Or maybe that's just something that uh, can be arranged to, to be given a little bit of attention for the benefit of uh, certain UK businesses? Sam, that's a great question. I'm going to let Andy and Livy off with this because there's other, somebody else we need to ask. Wasn't it good Mark Reynolds driving along in America? We're looking at the bridges. Everyone else is looking at the view. He's, he's looking at the bridges. That's what we want from the leader of the CLC. Now, uh, so Footbridge, I'm looking around for the Footbridge Consortium. Stick your hands up. Where are you to say something about selling it to Canada? Where are you? Maybe they're coming later. Ben, you can help with that. Where's Ben? Um, I, I know there's an interest from Canada and Australia as well. It's uh, dependent on the demonstrator being finished, so very likely there will be some sales abroad. Terrific. Very pleased to hear it. It's probably the bit that we've sold first of Living Lab, actually, the footbridge. So it's a great question, and that wasn't a planted question. I want to. I want to. And you know, let everybody know this is a success story that people should hear about. Yeah, because we heard how bad HS2 were at marketing, so we don't want the living lab to be as bad <laughs> at that. Now, we, we touched on social value a couple of times. I want just before lunch, Liz Holford here from Network Rail, who's a, who spends all our days thinking about social value. Liz, are we, are we missing anything? Are we getting it right? Are we heading in the right direction? Yeah, I found, I found guys, you know, the, the connection that Guy made between the harmonisation of standards and the way that that brings um, possibilities to, to save money in terms of the number of competencies that are required of people. But where my head went, and Guy and I were talking about this during the break, is that by addressing that, we could reduce some of the barriers to entry um, to the industry because at the moment, you know, yeah. we're, 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 you know, our demographic is, is pretty uniform. We're not great at yeah. social mobility. Um, and so, yeah, my, my brain was making the connection between. Brilliant. Between yeah. Those so things. I think that's a general comment that the OPEX, the people cost, the hidden people cost, which some people in this room really understand, uh, are, are often where the, the, the whole life value will take you, will take you to. So, big thank you to Andy and Livia. Let's give them another clap. That was some tough questions. Just before you go, I should give you encouragement. We've standardised apprenticeships across all sector for years. So it can be done, and apprenticeships are quite complicated too. So uh, it, it is possible. So thank you very much. Well done. Keep going. I suspect you'll be hearing a bit more about embankments by the sounds of it. That's going to be next. And, uh, and, the, and the whole life value piece. Thank you very much. It's time for lunch. So out there, 
uh, back here for half past one. So if you're going to go any shopping, in, in, you'll be back here for half past one. Thank you very much, everybody.